Last Tuesday, the manager presented his budget to us. Typically, what we have done on the, net, the meeting following the presentation by the manager of the budget is set aside time just to ask questions. And um, this is a consensus building exercise. A time for all of us to sort of open our ears and listen to what everyone's got to say, the manager, but other council members about questions. Um, I wouldn't expect anybody really, unless they're you know, intent on doing it, to declare positions or because this process is going to be a, a give and take process. So, um, what I thought we would do is just go around the table as many times as we would like and just ask questions. And, and whatever the manager can't respond to, he'll you know, try to get back to us during the, uh, during the week. And um, let me ask the first question before we begin. We'll begin with you, Andy. Um, uh, Marcus, is, are there any updates to the budget that, that you want to talk about? Any new numbers, any corrections or additions? Uh, you, or do you want, I know there are some, we've had some news from the school board. Or we think we may get some. Do you want to talk about anything? Sure. Uh, okay. Mr. Mayor, uh, I could talk about the school board now if you'd like. Um, I had a conversation with the school superintendent uh, yesterday morning in terms of the uh, remaining gap, um, about $822,000. I think the concept of the superintendent we're setting here, he would say that um, schools could always use more funding. Uh, so that, that that's a message that's loud and clear. Um, with that said, in terms of the immediate issue of the $822,000 difference between the budget that was uh, provided to council and where the school system may be right now, I do believe that sometime before the public hearing tomorrow night that we'll get a definitive statement that there are enough options available to them to close that gap. Um, still on the concept that Norfolk Public Schools could always use additional funds, but that immediate issue, it seems that that is going to be resolved prior to the, during the beginning of the public hearing. Um, and Mr. Mayor and Council, what we also do is we get updates on the revenue side. So I will tell you that right now, in terms of um, some of the collections in May, they come in at the end of the May, end of May, and some of the revenue sources that we're looking at, while we don't have an update in terms of additional revenue now, uh, the concept is we'll continue to screw up numbers between now and May 17th. So that's where we are uh, in right, terms of updates. Well, what, what happens, Councilman, when... Find out between now and May 17th. Sure. What we do is we... Right. We just don't stop the process. We continue on. And about the school system. They've adopted, they've proposed a budget that where they would spend so much revenue on, on needed um, expenses. And that they they now have found enough revenue within what they've asked us for, uh, together with new new monies. The eight hundred twenty-two thousand dollar request to us has been covered by additional revenue, which they've identified in two or three categories. Uh, and so uh, we may hear from the school system that they don't need any additional money from us um, over and above what the manager has already put in the budget. Okay. Andy, do you have a question for me? Sure. All right. So on page nine under budget overview. And it, what I've this is maybe what I've done is I I took the, the book and I did the same thing when we received last year's and I think I met with Stanley or somebody had a chance to fill me in on how uh, the budget worked. And what I did was I kind of went back. I almost had the same questions. Sorry, Stanley, but I think I have the same questions I had last year. Um, and I kind of marked them uh, with flags as to what, my, what I thought. Um, on this page, it lists the different reserves that we maintain. And I understand where the reserve, how you calculate the reserve. But at some point, a good example is we had a reserve from last year, I take it. Uh, how much was left over from last year's reserve? Well, uh, Councilman Prozero, it depends on which reserves. So let's start with, I think, the one you're talking about, the 5 percent reserve. Right, the $40 million reserve. Sure. Um, that's an excellent question. It, that's really a point in time, okay? It's where you end the fiscal year. So the goal is going into a fiscal year. We've said you take all the pluses, the minuses, all the revenue, all the expenditures, and at the end of fiscal year, June 30th, we want to have 
75% of what our approved budget was cash on hand. So it's, okay. it's a goal. So basically, where we would project to be at the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, would be at this 41 million five five nine two six three. And then, but that's one of three funds. That's right. All right. And then the other funds are also we want them to be available also, right? Right. And what we would hope is that gold column, G O A L. We look at this risk management reserve. We'd love it to be at 11.6 million dollars. We are closer to two million dollars. The economic downturn with leveling reserve, we'd love for it to be at 10 million. We're closer to two. Right. Is that money just roll over into the next year? Uh, let's deal with the risk management and the economic downturn reserve. Uh, yes, they do. The first one, again, is a point in time. And that point in time is where we'd like to end for the fiscal year. The undesignated general Yes, sir. Well, what I'm looking at is this. Is that's reserved for a hurricane, for tornadoes, or whatever that may come through, right? That's true. You would say something that's almost insurmountable. We would not want to ever tap into that. We have that economic downturn leveling reserve. That would be something that we would say, you could call it another rainy day fund, that we would go there before we would go to the 5% reserve. And the only reason I say that is that as we look at that 5% reserve, and we talk about well-managed government, best financial practices, there are jurisdictions that are at 10%. So one of those things we'll hopefully talk about in June is as we start to proceed, to what extent is 5% where we'd like to be, and can we even make that higher? So that's the, the concept is don't dip into it because we'd have actually like to strengthen it. Well, what's it for then? Well, it is literally, it is more so a best management practice. It's kind of sort of saying that um, in your home you may have a savings account that you typically are college fund that you don't want to tap in under any circumstance. So that's why, over time, the council came up with this economic downturn leveling reserve, because that is something that's more or less, okay, something occurs, something's happening in the economy, a one-time hit, that would be the reserve that you would go to first. So the $41 million that you project for 2011, that really is a rollover from what's still there from last year. I, would, I wouldn't use the word rollover. I would say that you basically um, end the year at a certain point, and then revenue starts to come in, right. how we collect it, whether it's real estate tax that's quarterly. And sometimes we are below that number. So I, won't, I don't want to mislead anybody to say that we always have $41 million in the bank. No, sir. Okay. So, so that is, again, it's, it's a point in time, and I would hope years from now that we would even discuss being above that. I will say that all is required right now for us is actually 39 million, okay? Because as the general fund budget decreased, you take that 5% and it gets a lower number. So literally, we can still be at that 5% at 39 million. So we're actually above the 5%, but we'd like to continue to be above it. And even have, at some point, we talk about practices versus policies, but at some point when you start to look at other jurisdictions, I would say 5% is just the entry bid. And, and, and it's very important, uh, appropriation for the rating agencies. So why okay. And I think 5% is regarded as the minimum. In, the, in these two other funds, risk management reserve and economic downturn, last week we talked about the IR, was it the IRS, the government requirements and how we... Um, that was labeled, the gas fee. The gas fee. Are these labeled or um, set up so that they can only be used for, are these those designated Sure, I, 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 I wish, right. yeah, I, that's one of those me, meetings that I'm sorry I didn't attend because I think what's very important is I think this council, my recommendation to this council would be not to let that $2 million drop into the undesignated fund reserve. In other words, to put enough parameters around it, how you would use it. Maybe you use it only when revenue decreases more than 5%. Maybe you use it in, you know, something that's a, a one-time hit that we understand the a year from now, it'll be different. But to let this drop in the undesignated uh, general fund balance, I would always um, present information to you that would suggest don't touch it. Once something gets in that, don't touch it. It's a rating, as Bern said, it, it's something the rating agencies look. So is there at. ever a point where we would not contribute money or designate money to this fund because 
we were doing so well and the economy was so good and we got into that 10% and then we would not, or, or do we just contribute to this for a rainy day forever, kind of like the savings account sure. that you just save sure. and save and save sure. until you die and leave it to your kids? Sure. Um, I guess two, two pieces. One is that um, we're not making an additional contribution this year to this $41 million. If you go back into what we call non-departmental, you'll see some years where we had to take funds, we had to take appropriation and actually put it in there just to make the 5%. So you could suggest that, you know, maybe we're taking the year off, but I would say it differently. We didn't start off by saying the goal is 39.3. We said leave this 41.5 exactly where it is because that gets you a little bit north of 5%. Now with the, the $2 million, you know, I would suggest that as we move forward, the, my, I guess, suggestion to council would be which pot would you like to fill up first? Would you like to start to get the undesignated reserve higher than 5%? Would you like to get the economic downturn leveling reserve higher than the 2 million? Are the goals too high for where we are right now? So those are some of the policy questions, but we will always, as administration, come to you protecting this undesignated reserve and even trying to get us towards the, the direction of staying well above that 5%. I mean, isn't it true that bells start to go off with rating agencies when you start tinkering with your undesignated uh, fund balance? I would tell you, uh, Mayor, if we started to mess with that um, before we could, um, let the ink, before the ink would dry, right. we would get some calls. This is where you don't want to go. So it's never used. Oh, we we don't want to. We I would not recommend using right. this. To well, that's you. what I'm trying to yes, figure sir. out. I mean, I'm learning. Yeah. Yeah. All right. How about in the risk management reserve? I understand. Do we have a policy? Bernard, do we have a policy? Can I, are you staying on me with this sure, page? Sure, and then we'll go to Paul. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Do we have a, 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 a policy with an insurance agency or insurance company uh, for the first so many million? Are we totally self-insured? We're not totally self-insured, but we are essentially self-insured. We have some exceptional insurances. We have one for our coverage at uh, Scope, and that we have one for coverage at Nauticus. Uh, and it's very limited and that uh, we not only have our uh, reserve fund for the city, we also have it for the schools. Uh, and the schools have a little bit more insurance than we do. They have insurance for their buses and, and vehicles, which we do not have, uh, but that uh, we are essentially self-insured. And uh, administration has asked the risk manager to look at the cost of an excess policy. The council has asked several times uh, whether it does make sense for us to cover the upper end, and uh, I know that's being reviewed right now, but I don't think it's in this budget. Right. Because we can go the first, we can be self insured the first two, three million, and after that, you just go with excess. I ask the question every year. Okay. Twice, Twice a year. And as a history, that was yeah. considerably higher when we had an automobile or a truck accident. Yeah, I understood that. But, that down. And I'm always told that the premium buy a five million dollar policy you could we could go for the first two sure. sure. take out a five million dollar policy yeah. and then you know go naked that on top of that well, how many companies you and i represent that do they spread the dollar. risk everywhere yeah you and i represent companies that have a million dollar liability policy and then they have another nine million dollar or i've even had where they yeah, had up to 33 million on top uh and they're usually national corporations that have uh, substantial assets. So, and then, uh, uh, so what I will okay. say, uh, Councilman Procher and uh, Mayor Frame, Jonathan asking more the RP is already on the okay, street. Okay, good. Okay. All right, so what we're, what we're looking at here is just so I can understand it. Goal is fiscal year 2011, and it's 11600000 That's the goal that you have. And then the projected is what's going to be left at the end of this year by June. Right, it's actually what we started with. So, it's, right. so that is not necessarily something that we tap into from time to time. This is something that before we even touched it, I would come to the scales. Right. Okay. And then economic downturn level. Give me an example of when you would ever use money from that pot. Um, we could have a hit per se, or recommendation to you. We would have a hit per se. Let's say in sales tax, something the state did that we know is going to shake our budget up. So instead of going in midterm and having a series of cuts, we would say, wait a second, we don't want to disrupt the government and services right now. So we would we would do that. 
that's an example. But we wouldn't go into this to do salary increases. We wouldn't go into that because fuel is increasing. This is something that over time, and we could give you a history of how it's been used, um, that we just don't access this fund just because something's um, not going right. So it's projected at the end of this year it'll be down to two million. Just to stay at two million. To stay at two million. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, there's 1.898 on the risk management reserve. I hope that if we've got anything coming on this year that we're... Uh, I don't think this is the full picture. Right. Okay. This is the reserve. Right. Uh, that in addition to the reserve, we have an appropriation that is based upon our loss history, okay. which is pr primarily composed of workers' compensation payments. Uh, and so that this is here in the event that our loss history okay. is uh, uh, worse than typical. He, ha he has a pot that he draws from that doesn't come back to this. this just that he we pays claims and all sorts of stuff. That's like 172 on the agency. Okay. That, that's all I have on that page. I'll wait and go around. Paul. Yeah. Um, what, what my concern is, is not even in the budget, and I brought it up uh, last week when uh, Stanley was in the chair, but I would like a clearer understanding of uh, what it would cost us to give our employees a pay increase. You know, uh, this is the third year that uh, we haven't had a pay increase, and certainly this is an employer's market because for every one job that you know, we have a thousand people would love to have it, or maybe I'm exaggerating when I say a thousand. But I just don't believe it's a wise and prudent, and I know we are not holding our uh, employees hostage, but I was thinking about the uh, cost of gasoline, and then I was reading an article yesterday how just one manufacturer, Procter & Gamble, which, uh, you know, manufactures and markets, I don't know, everything from soap to tissue products, they've gone up on everything. And we are just, you know, I don't think it's, while our employees still come to work with a, you know, with a, a cheerful continent, and uh, they try to do the best that they can do, I just really believe that somehow we need to stretch, um, you know, to give them some type of raise. Now, what I asked last week was, you know, what, what would it cost us to, for them to have a clear $800? And I understand you might be working on something like that. But I'm just wondering, you know, what we can do to give them a raise every, you know, with every paycheck that they get, whether there's uh, some new projects that might be on the horizon that we can hold up on. Uh, there, there's some things that, uh, that we maybe, I was thinking, if we only advertise in the Virginian pilot what we had to advertise to announce uh, hearings, to announce whether it's through the planning commission, whether it's city council, uh, you know, public hearings, and didn't spend another dime with, you know, you know how much money, you know, we say we didn't spend a dime in the compass with them. We did the only thing we spent with Virginia Pilot was what we had to do to advertise uh, public hearings and things we had to do legally, because uh, this is getting off the subject a little bit. But I just can't continue, see, continuing to to patronize somebody who beats us up all the time. Now, for example, in a newspaper today, the article was how much debt each citizen has with, you know, with this particular budget, you know, and, and as, a, as opposed to saying how much Norfolk pays per capita, you know, for school children, you know, instead of the positive things. So if we go down uh, uh, and start saving money on, on, on things like the pilot, which is, doesn't have any a great impact on raises. But I'm just wondering what we can do to give our employees a raise. And, and uh, certainly we might have been given five, six, or seven percent. But I really believe that we have to do something, you know, to show that, uh, that we realize that they're catching the devil. Uh, I was at uh, Costco buying gasoline, and Costco, their gasoline is almost four dollars a gallon, depending on what grade you use. And that's 13 cents less than on the street. <coughs> and I just really believe that, you know, and nobody has mentioned uh, trying to give our employees a raise. We just take it for granted they're going to come to work because they have expenses. But, you know, they are really uh, catching the devil. You know. 
and Mr. Rick, we, we do have some numbers for you. I, I will say that um, you know, what we did last Friday, we had a meeting on the 11th floor in the council chambers, which had all the department heads, all the deputies, all of the, um, the, the managers, uh, as well as the um, constitutional officers in the uh, appointed uh, positions to really talk about exactly what you said. Is there an opportunity for us right now to have some additional savings so that we can do something for employees in 2012. Also, we will start to think about 2013, even a year from now, what we can do. And literally, um, some of the conversations already have started to uh, show us some savings. So literally, I don't have a desktop anymore. Mm -hmm. It was one of those opportunities to say that I have, a, I have a laptop, why do I need a desktop? And so those are the kind of conversations we'll have, we are having. I will tell you that some of the numbers um, for instance, for a 1% general wage increase, the cost is about $1.6 million. We have what we call a step. Um, for this economic downturn, for the most part, and you hear this a lot from employees, um, this general wage increase was one thing, but the step is once you perform, the concept was that each year until you topped out, you would get something around 2.5%. So that step increase, which is really locked into your hire date and a good evaluation, um, having a step increase, the cost is about $2.2 million. Um, for your specific question, a $800 bonus, now that's the net, so I don't know what the gross up number is, but the net so that somebody can walk away with $800 is about $4.1 million. And if you just, just did a $1,000 bonus, no net, so in other words, the taxes would come out, that's about $3.8 million. So there's a range, there's some opportunities, whether it's a, a a 1% general wage increase, and you have one cost, all the way to this net concept of a $800 you get to take home, you know, after the city would pick up the taxes. The cost of that is about $4.1 million. But I will tell you that I, I can assure you as administration, we're looking for, and I said it last Tuesday, we're looking for opportunities because we've given you a balanced budget. Anything we can say over and above that, we would like the first calls of that to be some type of adjustments of salaries. And yet I was uh, looking at ways to save money. Now our Department of Development is over in the uh, Bank of America building. Um, economic was it BB&T? Across okay. the street, right? Yeah. Um, economic development is not like it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. We don't necessarily need a, a Main Street address for our Department of Development because nobody is flying airplanes into Norfolk to do business with us. And I'm just thinking about little things like that. You know, how, how could we save if, if, if there has to be uh, a, a room somewhere <coughs> in this building that we could bring them back in. And, you know, just things like that to try to save us some money. As I say, something like that certainly doesn't approach, you know, $4 million, but just little things of that nature. So uh, my first time around the table, I'm just concerned that uh, we let our employees know that although this is an employer's market, that we, you know, take for granted that we realize what they're called pay for gasoline. We're realizing that all of the products that they purchase because of the price of gasoline, you know, has increased. And so that's my, that's my first I, I ask Marcus, and I don't want to put you in a box because maybe okay. you haven't decided, but we'll say uh, you got to the point where you wanted to give every employee, uh, or that you wanted to get $1,000 bonuses, okay, just as a round number. Would you give $1,000 to the person who's making $26,000? thousand dollars to the person who's making 70 is that what's is that what you're um, doing? or are you talking about a different type of sure yeah um, not putting me in the box that's okay. fine the um, <laughs> what I'd like to do is first of all um, make sure that we have something that's related to performance I think it's very important um, that we start to lock into evaluations and performance and, and I mean in terms of supervisors in other words to me the most difficult thing is the supervisors has to they have to literally understand that how we are connecting evaluations to the priorities of the city. Um, having said that, there are some models that would say, let's make sure that the biggest bang goes to those employees who make the least amount. And at some point, what do you do with even the individuals who are at the, the top of management? You know, the concept of even them foregoing some type of increase would be something that we would discuss. So I would hope that um, as we move forward, it's not something that's just clearly blanketed across the uh, enterprise, but something that we can really make sure that the um, individuals who 
are at the um, the lower end of the salary scale can benefit from that. Well, you know, Marcus, I would suggest that because the employees haven't had a raise for so long, that initially, whatever we do, we make sure that everybody gets something, and then going forward, we make it performance based. Because whether you've been doing a great job or a so so job, you've still been doing the job for the last three years and you still haven't had a raise. So, you know, I think that all the employees initially, when we look at this, should get something. And then, you know, you can't say, I mean, I don't think we should say, we haven't given you all a raise, but now we're going to put parameters on how you get a raise. And, you know, every, other people who've been coming to work every day diligently, you know, for the last three years, and gas has gone up on them, and all their expenses have gone up on them. Well, you don't get a raise because you've done a bad job for the last three years, and maybe nobody told them, maybe they didn't have an evaluation, maybe, you know, whatever. So I think initially, everyone should get something, and then look at putting in place a standard for future raises, because everybody's been coming to work for the last three years with no increase. Okay, um, I've got a bunch of questions, but I just want to go to the revenue summary now. First of all, I would like to compliment you, Marcus, uh, especially on the next step that you listed on page nine, eight, nine, and look at the retirement system, streamline and outsourcing and what have you. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Well, you, you go to page on eight, nine, which you list some of the next steps. I mean, we've got the more, we've got the, it's, uh, we have this budget here, but it's clear, you know, at the conclusion of the next step, the same places he's going to look to continue to make us a What? Page nine. Page nine. Message. Nine. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I just, uh, things that you're looking at, I think it's more better, better, more efficient. And I want to compliment that we're not stopping here but uh, just a couple of uh, just take a couple of minutes and we'll go around a couple of times sure okay. uh, for instance on in the general fund which is on page 58 the revenue we got real estate tax refunds and personal property tax is that tied to board or what is, what is that you know, serious tax refunds this year but there's like 2.8 million this year projected that's a one-time event. Is that one-time And is that tied to the personal property also? Uh, that's uh, yes, sir. You got a million two next year in personal property tax. I mean, is that a, that's a big number. That who cares? Like one eight, one million, one four, one two. Is that? Uh, which line are you on? Personal property tax, about right halfway down. Sure. Budget a million two refund. Sure. If, if you look over at uh, Councilman Wynn, if you go, the, the best number on this is, is, is FY10, if you look at the actual. Right. So, so the actual, that shows that at least one year, a million eight. So it's been consistent in terms of about. Are we figuring it wrong? What are we doing? Are people going out of business and not paying us, or? Uh, you know, I will, instead of take a, taking a shot at it, I'll give you something that's more definitive than that in terms of the, uh, the, the refunds. Okay, I mean, I'm just, it just seems like a lot. I mean, if we sure. shoot too high, you know, you know, we're being it seems like we're being, not, not being realistic. Maybe we are. And you're talking about the 1.8 and the 1 million and the 1.4. Yeah, yeah. 450 and one two. Aren't those claims that are sometimes when people bring, uh, you know, once we've taxed them and they come in and object to your taxes and they and you work it out and sometimes your refunds, that's oh, what that is. Right. You have to pay those refunds at 10%. Yeah. So they can let that money sit and accumulate for so. a three-year period and you end up paying so much. I mean, it's better than putting the money in the bank. So, okay, Mark, you get 10% on your return. Okay. Is that yeah, I mean, I, yes, Virginia yes. Code, 10%. Why can't we get that amended? I mean, well, we get the judgment rate amended and pushed down. Why right. can't that be pushed down? Right. Why don't we just let our legislators know to move that? So that's, 
Yes. Make that a priority. That's a different. Okay. And on the next page, and these are just things that jumped out. On page 59, we got fire permits, which have been at 45,000, 40,000, 45, and next year it had $384,600. Sure. Okay. The um, in the presentation last week we did mention one series of um, fees that were going to increase. And when you start to look at the fire fees, uh, literally when you compare it to the other jurisdictions in Southampton Roads, we were we were way off. Is this when we respond to a fire? No, this is yeah, a, a laundry. This is a, it's a laundry list of probably 40, 50 different fees that were out of whack. And I will say that um, fire would say we didn't go far enough. In other words, that we are still inconsistent with uh, you know Virginia Beach, so Chesapeake in terms of fees. Fire permit. That's we've gone up like nine times. One example of a fire permit like the increase. Inspection, the initial inspection. We were out of whack on the initial. Inspection. So just like when the fire marshal comes to inspect for building permit or whatever. Sure. In, in some cases, Councilman, we were charging nothing, and the surrounding jurisdictions were charging fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. So it was, and I would say the same thing with planning. We didn't do it this time, but I would tell you we are so far off with our fees as we start to compare with other jurisdictions. We were so far off with fire that this one seems so much like the right thing to do. But that's that's the big increase. It's about three hundred. I think thirty thousand dollars worth of increase, but I will tell you that we are not the highest. We're not pricing ourselves out no, of the market sir. here. No, sir. And we can give you a list of each one of those fee increases where we. No, I don't really know. I don't know. I just, it just jumps out. I mean, it's just forty. Two other things, and I'll move, move on. On the page sixty-three, we got federal aid is up from five, five to ten next year. Schools. Right. Schools. So that our federal staff is getting more from the school. Yes, sir. And that's just a pass through. That's exactly right. And how about the rollover from last year? Sure. The, um, the, are some of those stimulus funds? Of course. On the federal we the schools this year. Sure. If, the, um, if we go back to this, the whole, um, if you look at schools, um, all in, I think they're down about five and a half million, maybe close to six million. But from the state perspective, there was, I think, a little over about eight and a half million down from the federal government. The uh, right, the federal funds were almost, you know, five million up. And I'll give the, the actual numbers. But the point is, with schools, um, the federal funding, some of that's related to stimulus, is uh, higher than um, what they received last year. And in terms of the state funding, it's much lower. But that doesn't impact the hundred million or whatever we give. That's no, sir. Right. How about? The down under other sources, a rollover from last year, 15 million. Right. The, the, from five. Okay, you're on page 63. Right. Under, other sources and transfer. Total. Oh, sure. Okay. Other sources and transfer. Right. Um, many of those accounts <coughs> we told to be cleaned out, we have to bring it in on the revenue side, and the bulk of them are showing up right here. So when we cleaned out those accounts. For the 17 million that we were talking about, that we went in, cleaned out accounts, had some savings things. Some portion of that is found so in that's that 15 a one time. million. Yes, sir. And for the most part, we tried to match those one times with one time expenditure. And this is not limited to federal rollovers. This is no. all categories. This is all. Of it, yes. you cleaned up construction accounts. And yes. Piled money. Yes. You say, but you know, originally we tried not to balance the budget with one time. Right. You're saying you put those on one-time expenses. Right, and I will tell you that it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not where we want to be, um, but we have more than you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of that that's easily tied to one to one to one-time expenditures. You know, you could make the case, and I said I really didn't want to do it. But we could have made the case and say, wait a second, we could have cut police and fire, but instead of cutting police and fire, we backfilled it with this, and I could have gotten this thing down to all, you know, a structurally balanced budget. But I think that. You know, that's one way of doing it, but the concept is that our intent was so not, not to cut a total of ten million dollars. We're no, not sir. starting the whole next year. No, no, sir. No, sir. Now, is that going to affect us next year? Well, it's going to be difficult. We'll start off 
because the moment that you use some one times, if you can't match all the one time revenues to one time expenditures, you do have an issue. And I think that we're probably in the three to four million range, which is different than the eight and a half million dollar range we started the 2011 budget with. But just in full disclosure, as we start to go through this, the concept would be can we continue to get savings in 2011 and additional savings in 2012? Because the moment I do that, then we get right back in the structural balance. Yeah, just to, to dovetail on what Paul said sort of about the ads and the paper and I just have to read with Paul. On our broadcast on 28 and what have you, are we being affected with the cost we're spending on this? Like the community we're out, whatever we're doing, you, you go through and you look at them, and you never really know what's going to be on when, and you just kind of, I, I don't know whether there's, there's ways to save there, whether we're effectively bidding out the production of this. Things with the advertising and media. Sure, we can look at that also. Uh, so if anybody go through the programming you pay, I know we have a deal with WHR. I don't, I don't have anything. I think we're an RFP that's on the that's coming up. The uh, contract is out for RFP for competitive bid. Um, the, um, the analysis we've done shows that we're getting a with added value, getting a good deal, okay. it was out for RFP. It may well be. Um, we do have an issue where um, our civic leagues uh, get a schedule. You all get a schedule. All Norfolk gets a schedule. We need to look at that. The paper now charges us to advertise if we want to put our uh, schedule in compass. Um, and so we cut that years ago for a cost cutting. But, but I do understand exactly what you're saying. As a matter of fact, at one point, um, we're working with schools in terms of um, the uh, uh, opportunity to have shared services. Exactly. That's one of your things you're talking about on the Yes, sir. What we go from here. That's exactly. Perhaps a they're broadcasting idea. and they're, we're broadcasting and they're filming. I mean, I, right. I just would like, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I just would like somebody, maybe Bob's done it to go through and say this is an effective way to spend our money. We reach them who we want to reach and put them on. Instead of having to call them, somebody come on, we to get you to fill some time. On. Channel 48 tomorrow. Maybe it'd be a good idea to get a copy of Bob's analysis. Okay. Well, just just one more comment on that. Um, I know there's, there's sometimes that you're going to want to do ads in the compass for sure. You know, you know that. Um, I think some of these ad guys might tell you that a half a page gets you almost the same impact as a full page. Gets you. And I know that's low hanging fruit, and I know it's not. Going to buy a lot of seven other lunches, but I mean, there are ways there. Jerry? It is our budget. It's, uh, it's a little over 200000 So it's pretty low. Income. For HRO. And for the non HRO? Like the filing? I think it's 240 just for HRO. So what did we, uh, we used to do council updates, and so. So we, there are some savings there, or are we still operating? Even though we don't have that, it's still the same cost. Those were those were savings that we got a few years ago. Um, it's important to remember, too, that we're not just doing television broadcasting from WHR on our productions. That's what's feeding our content for both the website, uh, YouTube. Um, so our message is a lot broader than just what's on TV 48 and on cable now. Um, what you're seeing, what the viewer is seeing now uh, is on Norfolk.gov, and then it will be on 48. Um, I might add that we are getting tremendous response from the public about the quality of programming. Uh, when we do a lot of our YouTube, we're able to measure now. Uh, also, our, our web content we're measuring. So the, uh, the citizen has expressed numerous times to us uh, about uh, anecdotally about the quality of programming. Uh, and the people that are on the show, we are really no longer having to beg people to come on, but uh, people are actually coming on the, the different products that we're doing. And then we've got, we do numerous hours of programming off studio. Okay. Terry. Um, Marcus, I would certainly commend you for bringing any of these departments, consolidating them and bringing them together. And I, you know, I know I'd shared my frustration with, for instance, as an example, the all the <coughs> programs we had for youth in, in our city and how the right hand didn't necessarily know where the left hand was going. But, but consequently, 
and I read through some of this stuff and a, and a program is deleted because it's come under something else, it was difficult for me to figure out what was happening. Is, did anybody else experience that or was I just a you little budget challenged? No, not where why it went away, but where did it go? Oh, yeah, okay. And when it went to that new place, is it now a bigger program or are we spending more, are we spending less? For instance, like the, the youth program in the summer. That was take it, you know, that was a extracted and it went under parks and rec, but it's kinda hard to figure out sure. exactly. So what I'm asking for if there's any way we could do kind of a flow chart or something to kind of demonstrate those programs that you consolidated, where they've gone, so that to get kind of an idea of, of um, what the funding now is and whether what the impacts would be. Sure, and, and, okay. and Dr. Wibbley, as a matter of fact, that's what all this color-coded stuff is. Um, the, um, I guess we used to call them yellow sheets, but some of the issues that come up, that come, come up already, we're trying to get them into a, a book for you. I will say with the youth programs, um, is a great example, and the example that you used is probably the best one. So if you just bear with me for a second. Um, we had the Summer Earn and Learn. It was in what we call non-departmental. It was in the middle of the budget book, and as a matter of fact, uh, midway through this community outreach, it was very clear to me, a couple of council members uh, mentioned that, please don't let this program go away, it's a good program. And I said, we'll find money for it, because I believe it's a great program. Um, it's actually administered by human resources. But it's a program that's dealing with you. So what we did is we moved the program and every penny associated with it over to this new Bureau of Youth that's in Rex Park, it's an open space. We also did things like um, anything that dealt with um, youth in general. So we, we moved it there. And we used this example of saying, okay, where you can take a uh, program and move it in, or you can scale it down first and move it in. We moved it in all in. So now Daryl has this uh, great responsibility of producing one of the greatest youth programs in the next, you know, 12 months. But the concept is we didn't cut it. We truly believe, and I had department heads that were concerned, had the same concerns, why did you take this from me? And I said, that's not how we operate. We're dealing with youth across the system. So Nancy Olivo and staff will still continue to do the paperwork, but if Daryl is focusing on what used to be youth just from ages 5 to 12, now he's got 13 to 17, he's got a comprehensive look at it. So I will tell you, if we took some, a program out uh, and dismantled a program, we, we'd tell you that. But when you saw the zeros and said it moved to the department, we moved it all in. But, but, but I didn't always know exactly if it was going to be funded at the same level, yes. um, too, would be helpful. Sure, we'll, we'll put together a diagram for you. Just a couple quick questions. I guess this is generic to, I guess, to the entire budget. From a contractual agreement, uh, and I know I, I, you know, coming in uh, February 1, um, you really haven't had that time to um, kind of dissect every contractual agreement that we have um, outside uh, of the city. Uh, and so, one of the things that I, I you know, I've always, I've, thought, I've said this before, uh, in terms of things that we outsource, you know, um, in terms of how much money could we possibly save. Uh, I know that there are some savings when we look at creating our own temp pool of employees and cutting out that middleman. And I've seen the, the, the checks that we write to the staffing companies and uh, uh, to bring back the same people. And again, I don't think we've had the opportunity to work that into this budget. But I know going forward, I would hope that uh, as we get through this, we can hopefully, I mean, uh, uh, I think make sure will be somewhat challenging. Um, as you alluded to earlier, in using these one time expenditures. But I think that. Uh, that's a, a great way to get ahead of the curve looking at uh, next year. And if we can't uh, um, um, find the resources to give our, our employees uh, or begin to, that, 
uh, cost of living increase or raises that Mr. Riddick alluded to, that we be, uh, that this will start that process and this will yield us some positive revenue. Um, because again, I think that when we begin to look at the contractual agreements outside and see if they make sense, you know, um, and if they don't make sense, how can we mitigate that too? Um, to look at ways where we can provide uh, stimulus in-house to put people to work ourselves uh, within our city, opposed to uh, outsourcing that. One of the issues we talked about summer programs um, and you know providing opportunities for our youth. Um, and we talked about that program, how it was structured. Uh, and um, one of the issues that we're faced with in the five, well, Mark alluded to this time ago about cutting grass. And uh, coming up, we had a lot of youth that did that. I don't know if it's, it's an insurance issue now, but uh, in terms of um, creating opportunities <coughs> to provide gainful employment for our youth, uh, to be able to take an opportunity of uh, 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 or five dollars, about fifteen, sixteen dollars, I'm cutting grass. But I think that that would be more prudent than to go out and hire another employee, thirty thousand dollars for five months uh, of, uh, of summer of employment. I eat somewhat know what I'm alluding to there. Um, the other question is in terms of uh, vacancy savings, in terms of uh, uh, employees that have. Uh, <coughs> Uh, left the job that were funded in this last budget, how much of that uh, that we uh, uh, have an opportunity to uh, realize in this particular budget. And looking at next year's budget, even though we have the new folks that uh, took early retirement, within this new, this 2012 budget, are those positions there um, or have we uh, did away with those positions right up front going into 2012. Sure. Um, and and uh, Councilman Burford, those actually work well together, the concept of uh, the temp pool and the vacancy savings. I'll start with the temp pool. Um, you're exactly right. The markup on that was about 44%. Not a good way of doing business. Um, the moment that we created this opportunity for our own temp pool, if you will, the moment that you passed the ordinance that allows us to hire back retirees part-time. Right. I think a lot of folks got, um, we got a lot of folks' attention. They've actually uh, renegotiated those rates and brought them down. But I will tell you this, that having that pool of individuals who understand our systems, being able to come back, I'm not 100% convinced that, uh, well, let me put it a different way, our use of that, those particular contracts are just gonna go get smaller and smaller. Right. To answer your question about the vacancy savings, we did, and the, I think the word in the budget is preliminary, we did capture a million dollars. And I'll tell you, we're gonna, we'll get a million bucks, no doubt about it. Um, roughly 149 positions. Um, to answer your question, um, we didn't eliminate those positions for the people who took advantage of the voluntary retirement incentive program, LIBRA. Um, however, in order to hire someone back in that position, it takes a signature from me. Right. So at some point, we believe that we will not need all of those 149 positions. And let's just say that even if we did, which we don't, um, for every day after July 1 that I keep that position vacant, there are some savings. Once I get past the million that we've already believed that we will get, there's additional savings. And if we are able to eliminate some of those positions permanently because they're not necessary for the um, provision of services and programs, then that's where you get that long-term savings in this whole concept of the one-times dwindles. So, so we did say a million dollars. Um, I know we're going to be able to do more than that, and that's why I'm confident that we'll be able to do something with employees. Well, I, I just, you know, when I look at this budget, I, I, for me, it more so sets the tone for next year. Um, you know, um, so I just didn't see a lot of, uh, I, I think you did a tremendous job getting where you are. I mean, we could be aggressive, and, uh, but I don't think it's really the opportunity nor the time to look at uh, increased 
increasing real estate taxes or anything like that. Um, but you know, when you look at it in terms of what people would be paying, um, opposed to what they were paying, um, I, I just don't see that. But I, I do hope out of this budget some of those core services, um, and I'm still going through this, uh, some of those core services that people uh, continue to uh, speak to, as, uh, like code enforcement, uh, those types of things uh, uh, will not be, um, I won't say cut back, but the, that the, the focus will, uh, will increase. Uh, in those areas. Um, I know that in some departments we uh, uh, didn't have the adequate number of folk to be able to, to carry out the task that was, uh, uh, that was uh, put before them. So I would hope that, uh, you know, within this budget as you move things around and as you consolidate, like Dr. Whitley said, this uh, that's, uh, in terms of uh, we're getting rid of things that didn't work and we're consoling them in such a way that they can be and more efficient and will work, you know. And so um, um, yeah, that's all I really had. Mayor. Thanks. Angela? Oh, sorry, but there's one other thing. And just to get to what, what Eve said earlier, Mark, I think that that's an area, I think that's an offline conversation, but uh, I think that this an area that that line item that you alluded to as it relates to our refund. That's something we really need to look at and uh, begin to monitor that because uh, I think that there are some entities that understand that uh, 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 and the state law, state law. But uh, uh, I just think that we are we're getting uh, really uh, taking part uh, on that. When I look at the, the types of uh, refund checks that we are writing, uh, I think that that could uh, be mitigated. But I don't think that's something that we need to talk about. When you talk about wage increases um, for the current employees, are we thinking also about wage increases for our retirees? Um, and, any addition, and any additional um, contributions to their health care? Sure. Um, the numbers that I shared with you earlier, they do not do that. Um, typically what we have is um, something called retirement board. It would suggest they have a COLA or a cost of living adjustment. Um, right now, I don't have that number. I could give you a history of what we've done. Um, unlike the Virginia retirement system that has an automatic COLA, we, we do not. Um, I will tell you that in terms of um, health care for our retirees, while on one hand we can say um, because we blend the two, the experiences, in other words, health care alone, one would suggest would be more expensive for a retiree. But what we do is we take the retirees with the actives and we blend it so the actives play a little more, the retirees play a bit less from the splendid rate. Um, but ultimately, a retiree could come in and say, you know, all you do is give me $25 per month, because that is what's uh, implicit as we go through this. But that is something that uh, we've discussed um, annually. To answer the question directly, when I gave you the numbers, it's really just for the active employees. And for the most part, the adjustment for the retiree would come from a COLA, from the retirement board. And, um terms of shared services, sure. um, there are probably some things that we have folks doing, like for the grass cutting that Anthony um, used as a reference and things like that, that possibly the sheriff's office may be able to do with their work of these. Sure. I don't know what the liability issues may be, but um, any of those guys and girls can go on work release, have to do supervised work release um, for the sheriff's department first before they're allowed to go off into independent jobs. And so we may be able to make better use of them um, in that capacity and save the city some money for it. We, I don't know how the revenue, you know, how that would 
how we contribute to, you know, pay the share bonds or not pay them or, or whatever, but um, we could possibly do something there to get some things done. Sure. We, we actually have, as a proposal in this budget, it's really a three-pronged approach. Um, to some extent, um, the sheriff's uh, work crews will be assisting um, Daryl and his staff. Daryl and his staff will be out there. In other words, there are no, um, no one lost a job as it relates to um, groundskeeping um, because of this new relationship with the um, sheriff and his work crews. And as well as we have the third piece is that we contract out also. Um, and to the extent possible, anything we do with the, the youth programs that we have. So we, while it may not be um, the best right now, we are definitely going down the road to basically say we, we believe we have to partner both with the private sector, the public sector, and even the resource sector, the sheriff's office. So that's a part of the, the 12 post budget support. How does that work? Um, basically, uh, there were three, there are a number of positions that are frozen in the sheriff's office. And what has occurred is the sheriff, uh, Major O'Toole, has been working with um, my staff over in um, Parks and Urban Forest Street to basically say, okay, this is everything that we have to cut. Are there some things, whether it's uh, drainage ditches, things of that nature, that um, these three positions, these three positions, no ads, these positions were frozen, um, that if we fund those three positions, he would provide three work crews to um, augment our own cutting. When you say funded, what do you mean? Just the, um, the deputy. So the sheriff's deputy would be in charge of a crew. So the funding of that sheriff's deputy gives you resources to go out and, again, help mitigate some of the issues. I, I will say that one of the things that I don't think, uh, there are many things we can improve on. Um, one of the things is that it's very important that we always tell council exactly what's happening. Um, last year, while there were cuts to um, Daryl's budget of Rex Parks and Open Space. Um, the grass started growing again, and we just went out and started to do it. So Daryl's going to have a shortfall this year. So we did stuff without funding. So in other words, you know, it's very important that there's some opportunities to be responsive to the council, and we can partner with it. So in other words, we could have, we could potentially have, say, six positions frozen. And if we utilize the sheriff's work crew, we would use, use three, we would take three deputies, as, a, as the example you're giving. You would hire three. And deputies. fund those three positions, still saving us the additional three that were frozen. Right. Am I, am I understanding well, that correctly? Well, or another way you can look at it is that, you know, the state says, I'm going to participate this way with your sheriff's deputies. And the state has said, this is what's going to be my participation. For us to unfreeze these positions, it's 100% local money, okay? So the state says, I'm not partnering that. That's your calls, the city of the Norfolk. Um, so let's say that that's the cost of it, 100% of those <coughs> positions. We hope that the benefit is that I don't get beaten up too many Tuesdays as we come here and there's issues with tall weeds and grass and things of that nature. So you will have three sheriff deputies full-time to run the crews. Exactly. <coughs> Along with Daryl's Darryl staff, right. Along with the private entities yes, yes, that you would, yes. And the private entities are the seasonal <coughs> contracts. That, that's right. So we, the hope is that, and I will not put Daryl on the spot, but the hope is that um, the plan would be he can utilize his staff in um, the most optimal way, and everybody who's picking up a piece of it. And the other thing is that um, how do we go about with just um, maintenance of, let's say, medians to begin with? Should everything be grass? Do you do more mulch? So we, we're rethinking the way that we handle this because I can tell you that we put money in Daryl's budget to, um, and I hope I use the term uh, correctly, to, to take care of weeds because some of the stuff that you see is not grass, yeah. it's, weeds. it's weeds. So the weeds are growing and we're out cutting weeds. So if we just treat the weeds, we won't have the issue of having to have crews out to cut weeds, not grass. So it's a logical approach, um, and it's 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 a shame that sometimes when we do these across the board cuts, we just cut, and we don't look at the logic behind what we did when we did. 
and that's why we didn't do across the board cuts. And Daryl gets more money to fight weeds, but he can't put it down today. He's got to put it down at the right season. So those are some of the things that we're trying to work. Did I do right by you, Daryl? Yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, was in, I was in the, on the tail end of that, but uh, I certainly uh, hope that uh, there's nobody in that campaign to put the sheriff's deputies to work and, and people, you know, to work for the sheriff. The sheriff has money and he has to get his own. And uh, I'm totally opposed to maybe funding deputies when we have other ways to do it. You know, look at the sheriff, you know, crying and moaning. And, and then trying to get some out of every pot. And so I'm totally opposed to hiring sheriff's deputies. Let's do it with our people. Um, just, you know, totally we opposed. get it done, Paul. We get it, get it done. We need to get it done, but I'm sick and tired of the sheriff. I'm sick and tired of the sheriff. Darrell, when you figure out the weed thing, you want to come to my house and tell me how to. How to, how to <laughs> <laughs> just I'll, I'll pay you for that. It's not right. It's not. Um, Obviously. Just a joke. Let me. Um, there was an article in the paper, and I don't want to respond to the article in the paper. This morning, but uh, could you print for us uh, what our debt guidelines are? So, okay. And what we take into consideration when we issue debt. So we have it in a written format in front of us. I know we had a presentation. But there's some things we take into consideration and some things that we don't. Okay. Um, on page 375 of the Slover Library, I just want to make sure everybody understands that the $31 million in there are privately raised funds. The city is not, is not going to issue debt to cover that, that $31 million. We're anticipating those monies to come to the city in the form of a gift. Thank you so, so much. But if, I mean, Yes, I mean, I am there so is some confusion about reading you know, about our capital expenditures. It's thirty-seven million for the slover. It, when, it sends the wrong message. I, I know. I mean, at the end of the day, there's going to be well, well over forty million. I mean, I there's in, that wouldn't go not into our capital, but also into an endowment fund for for the library. And there is some question, you know, that in some people's minds about could we get tax credits for the reuse of the old building, which would put millions more into an endowment for us. So, um, what kind of historical tax credits? Yeah, right. I know that's a bear okay, to work <laughs> with, with historical tax credits. But the, but the, the numbers for a building like the, we're we're going to redo the old Seaboard building are, could be eight million dollars. So you might want to go through the brief for something like that. So, I mean, just so we so we have it in our hands, so we can, or, we, or you might, you know, put it up online what our sure. debt guidelines are. Sure. There was a, a comment in the paper about. Light rail, about thirty million dollars. That you that the, the city may have to come up with another thirty million dollars for light rail capital needs. You want to? It's not in your budget. Sure. Why not? That's right, uh, Mr. Mayor. The um, there was a presentation, I believe, um, maybe in January about whatever the gap may be with light rail, um, and I believe we did a follow-up presentation in um, February, and I believe uh, basic council said come back when. We have uh, more information where we'll end up. Um, our goal is to whatever that gap is to get it to zero. The reason we made the presentation was to basically say here's the gap. Um, and I will tell you that um, and I think that the number back then was 50 million. You know, it was hard to just really 40 million. And I will say that that's not where we're going to be. As a matter of fact, we've already identified some funding sources. Uh, I believe that we'll come to you before this budget before you vote on this budget to actually amend the 2011 budget because we have identified close to you know, $10 million in, in uh, resources. So no, our goal is to get that down to zero. And that's where we're headed in terms of any additional funds. And what, from day one when that, you know, when Mr. Shuket came out with his budget, we were concerned about the size of it. We had issues with how much contingency was in there. But our goal is to be for the local for our budget as a city is has been to the city budget to be held harmless. We, you know, we paid fair money for what we thought was a system that you know that we we bought a system. We didn't expect to buy all the other headaches that came with it, and so we're going to try to make sure that the city's uh, held harmless with that. We're pretty close to that right now. We may not get there, but we think we can. 
Um, uh, what other thing? I'm sorry. Um, for a long time, uh, Marcus, we've, the water fund has been returning about eight and a half million dollars to the city budget, and that number has been constant for 15, 20, I mean, for a long time. Eight and, and it was predicated, it's a return on investment. And we haven't, and we've been getting the same return and it's been a fixed dollar amount as opposed to as, as a percentage amount. What is the um, There is, we have a public utility, the water system, in which we're entitled um, to have a return on investments, on that investment. And I lost the page. I, wait a minute, it's on page 63. And it's, it's eight and a half million dollars. And I know there are a lot of issues about the return on investments uh, for a utility and who gets the money and, and um, Actually, it pays for their calls on that money, for lawyers and uh, uh, other other things that have to do with, with the rate. But we haven't. The system is substantially stronger and larger than it was when it was when we first started out at eight and a half million. I mean, we have other contracts that people are buying water from us for, and I'm not suggesting we. I mean, I just want to know how the eight and a half million dollar figure is arrived at. And what what the basis for I mean what the justification for it is I know we can justify it, but should at some point in time we look at that number again to see if you know if the citizens of Norfolk are to get a, a better return on that investment in which they invest, make investments into you know, yearly and yearly I mean should we treat our community better? I've often uh, on that same point I often wondered why. We, ch we charge less than to other folks for our water, but yet we charge our citizens more. Why shouldn't we get a premium when it's our water? That's a mystery. Which well, <laughs> I, I've asked because I would hope that you would, you would look into that. I don't know. I mean, I think that we should be charging other municipalities more, uh, and, and, and the, the benefit goes to our citizens. Well, usually there's a contractual relationship there. Yeah, but some of those contracts, like I said, from a contractual agreement, I would hope that we would look at all contracts to understand when they're when we start negotiating them again that we'd be in a position to look at it and say, hey, we got we got to do business differently today. Yeah, and I, yeah. you know, I think it's a really good question. That's because the water system. We haven't had a presentation about our water system in here in years and years and years. Um, we do have a, a, a very old distribution system, so we probably distribute. We probably put more into renewing our water system so we don't lose so much in the ground, as in Fairmont Park, for instance, yeah. as the a Virginia Beach or a Chesapeake does. Right. And so maybe, I mean, there, there are reasons for all of this. You know. and when you look at our aging infrastructure, I mean, you got so many leaks, you know, and so, I mean, you get. I tell you, for, for a system our, of our age, uh, we lose, I mean, I think, this is an old number somebody used with me once, it's not unusual for a city our, of our age to lose 15, 18 percent of its water supply in the water before it ever gets to the right. taps. But in the city of Norfolk, we're losing, you know, five, six percent. And that, that's a number that came out of the last drought because <laughs> we, we realized that we needed to do something with all the pipes. But uh, that's why I look at the water, the rainwater every day, Mark. See, you know, I hope we are I hope we're continually to go after those federal grants. I don't think we'd have been able to get as much done in Paramount Park if we had not yep. take, taken advantage of those federal grants. I want to go back to this issue of grants coming in. You know, it's five months out the new year. And I just don't want this folk out there just cutting grass. Okay. I, I want people out there, I want the bodies to do nothing for me. But I want people out there that are going to cut grass, take pride in, you know, the job that they're doing. They're going to edge, they're going to cut, and they're going to clean up behind themselves, you know. And so just getting people out there with a more and running over and, and doing damage opposed to, you know, I, I just think that we got to get our arms around this thing going forward in years to come. you got five wards. And I think that you can systematically break this thing down, whereas you got what I call spot people. I know this outside the budget, but there's somebody that should know every intersection, you know, every because again we're talking about common areas, properties that we own. You got two facets of that. Then these gym properties, Tall Reese Wayne does that. But 
again, these common, and every week that that person should be in this car riding around. Barclay, to read. none of these people should have to call, you know, because we should have teams out there knowing where these areas are. It's the same areas every year, you know. And we should not only be taking these properties down, when we take a piece of property down, you know, when you look at that site, you know, we don't uh, seed it or uh, do the things that, that we need to do to make it look attractive to the community. We create more blight, you know, and if we're going to be holding our citizens to a standard in terms of what they're supposed to be doing with their yards and what have you, we need to hold ourselves to that same standard. And, and that's not happening. You know, so and again, I don't know. And I, I, you know, I don't know what we need to do to get there. <coughs> but I, I don't think we should have to call every week. And that's five months, five months out the year. Uh, that it's this about is seven. Right. About seven, but yeah, well, about yeah, about, yeah. Depending on the month. Yeah. If you're going to later to. If it's five months. It's five months for you for Barkley. It's at least seven. Well, you know, I guess yeah, we know. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he does. Yeah. Thank you, back on that. I wouldn't get it. I, I, 11 years I've been sitting here, like I noticed we got next year, we got 1,050 trees to plant. We can't take care of what we got out here. We planted 1,050 last year. I'm not for spending any more, I'm, I, I didn't give a great budget, but I'm not for spending money on any capital or anything of one penny outside of operations. <laughs> you can convince me you're going to take care of what we got. If we got to put an extra whatever it is in the park. You know, we start this neighborhood project that you have, and we're, you know, we can't hold anybody to any standards when our parks are a foot tall and they run out of money. If you run out of money in March and say, okay, well, now we're going to cut back. I understand if we run out at Town Point Park, so with that investment, we can't do anything until July 1st. So I, I'm all about moving ahead in this city, but I am not, I, you know, I am so over people telling me riding around and being embarrassed, not only downtown, but Ocean View, Ford's Corner, all over the city about this, the way our public areas look, our schools, our fields, they can't play softball because the fields aren't cut. And that's not, I'm not affecting on you, it's a money thing. I just don't see continuing to build and spend when we can't take care <coughs> of what we got. Sure. And just to piggyback again, you got an offer me down the house. You know, at some point, we got to be able to consolidate service. It makes no sense that they would cut all the way up to city property and then wait for the, the grass this high, six feet tall, and then we got to wait for city staff to come out there and cut city's property. I mean, at some point, we got to consolidate what we have. You got schools, you got Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority, and you got city. Okay. North Redevelopment Island Authority got their own equipment, independent of, of us, okay? And so I don't understand why we're not having the conversations about consolidating. And when you're out there in an area, you cut the whole thing. You know, that just makes no sense to me. This is one city. We, we, we act as though sometimes from a departmental standpoint that we're a different city. You know, our funding come from, our <coughs> funding come from us, a part of it. And, other money is federal, but again, there is no reason why we can't look at areas of our city and say, look, we're going to work together. When you send your guys out geographically, this is what they're going to do. This is what we're going to do. It should see, be seamless, you know, but it's not that way and it has not been that way. And it's about time we get on the same page. And I think if we had that conversation, then that'll, that'll help uh, Mr. Crittenden and his staff. You know, because I shouldn't have to say, well, who's doing this or who's doing that. That should be seamless. You know, so I would hope as we move forward within this budget that that would be a conversation. Uh, you know, if you can't do it this year, maybe next year, but that calm, that dialogue has to start sooner than later. And, and, I, and I, I agree with you 100%, and I think I'm not misstating. Daryl wrote the plan this weekend. Uh, yes, sir, I did. Okay. okay. Part of your synergy meetings was for us to collaborate with NRHA. So, so. Have we gotten the result? I mean, look at what we're doing. Well, right now we're using the Sheriff's Department. We didn't have that service this year, but if we go into next year, we'll have the Sheriff's Department. Part of 2013, the city manager has asked that we <coughs> collaborate with NRHA. What are we going to do in 2012? We're going to make sure that each Tuesday you don't have to come to me 
talk about tall weeds and grass. We, we get it. We don't need putting greens. We need something 30 miles an hour looks good. Sure. People come in and I'd approach you about the garden would be glass with me and approach you for a car will stop the garden. Just go take a look at stop the garden. And it's it's a mess. There's no excuse for it. We gotta get out of front of special events. And it can't just be downtown and we've got all this beautiful planting and still get rain soon. We're gonna start losing when we plant it. We're gonna drown in the middle of April. So on the first of May. So I've got to be convinced that we're going to take it seriously. Every year I have this conversation, and every year this kind of goes away. I'm, 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 I'm over it. It's really over it. And it's not this administration. It's, you know, I talked about the privatizing. Put out the bid, though, in this municipality. They have inspectors, and they, and they put things out to the bid. And if you don't want to cut the grass, you don't pay. If you don't raise the bed, you don't pay. If you don't weed, you don't pay. I push for an experimental, yeah, take the school, or take the park, or take the medians, or take the medians on dinner. Put it out the bed. I think you'll find out it's not going to be done better, but you'll save money. I need to be convinced that, it, that we're going to take this seriously. You know, it's a real problem to me. It may not be to anybody else. Well, while we're jumping on it, <laughs> i got to ask about, I mean, I'm always confused, too, about what's the state's responsibility and because even though they have a different responsibility it impacts on the way our city looks and the Brambleton and, and Hampton Boulevard is it it hasn't been mowed all spring best I can tell getting into the midtown and the same bulldozer is still there not moved and I know yeah you can barely see it yeah I see the geese no but the geese <coughs> yeah and I mean the same with all of our ramps and medians. I mean, isn't there something we can do at the at the state level? At, um, you know, I, I just think it speaks to all of this. Well, we can try, but they're flat out of money. I know they are. That's where we are, flat out of money. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, 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 that's where we are right now. So what's their plan? Like any money to do it? Well, I mean, there's some things we ought to be talking about, but right now we can't talk about. It. I don't. I mean, we can absolutely contact our VDOT reps. That for sure, but. Um, they're going to tell you they don't have any money to cut grass. I mean, it's terrible. So let's, uh, Andy, why don't you go next? Okay. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. Oh, speaking of the water, is there a, a function that the uh, fire department has to open up these fire hydrants and evacuate water from time to time? Who may have achieved here? They don't know, sir. Uh, the Department of Utilities. May take an action like that periodically. I mean, so the, but, but the utilities department does do that. Now, if, if my, my point, whether it's utilities, and if it is utilities, that's fine. Instead, you know, can we capture that water and put it in some type of, uh, I think we have a truck that irrigates, you know, instead of just letting that water run, 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 we can use that water to, you know, when we need to water some of our property. I think we have an irrigation truck, if I'm not mistaken. I've seen it. Yeah, we, we, we have a couple extra ones, huh? too. Yes, yeah, we do. I've got one. Batteries don't work. It's kind of like But it is range. Yes, uh, You know, when utilities does that, and, and, and yeah, you know, utilities is what it does that. Let's capture that one. So just let it run. Let's capture it and reuse it. Andy, does one. I have two questions. First, on page 51. October markets, I had asked the numbers that I received the debt numbers. And the what numbers? The debt numbers. As how we were vis a vis the other cities. I received that last October. And what I'm looking here is, is that from June 30th, 2010 to June 30th, 2011, we have basically a 10% increase in the amount. I know that. Me jumping ten percent. Can you tell me where where it's going? Sure, I'm going to take the first shot at it, it but I prompted Daryl Hill before he walked in the room. Um, a, a couple things. When you look at page fifty-one, this this, this billion dollars, um, there is debt that is compared to our legal limit, right. but there's also debt that we believe over a period of time that we will issue. Is that where you want to stand in, Daryl? You want to come in? 
So in other words, this I want to start by saying this. We just passed an ordinance last week. It talked about a legal debt limit, and it showed 43%, and this shows 54 Okay, the 43 is correct. All right. Um, this is everything. The 43 is more so along the lines of what we actually would issue. As the mayor said earlier, what we want to do is just give you a nice little yellow paper which talks about our two internal limitations. This is the, um, the constitutional limitation. We won't get to 100%, okay? You know, because we have something that's more restrictive. We have um, the budget, excuse me, debt service as a percentage of the budget and debt service as a percentage of real estate, about 3.5% for real estate, 10% for the budget. This is just what every jurisdiction is uh, compared against, is this constitutional limitation. And what I'm suggesting is that we are south of 50% in terms of what we could issue. Well, I understand, but why am I looking, and, and I still, I appreciate the answer, but I, maybe I just don't get it. How can I, how can we go from June 30, 2010, when we all came on, when I came on council, and I'm looking at 10% more on June 30, 2011, where did that come from? One small amount is that the assessed total assessed value has gone from a uh, billion nine hundred ninety-four million to a billion nine hundred thirty-one, so that your uh, basis is is lower by what's that sixty million? Sixty million dollars. So basis that's difference. a small small that, right that would cause the percentage to increase slightly. But 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 the actual is that an actual dollar amount from eight eighty-nine to a to basically a billion, then that would be irrelevant. Well, that's your question. So, Daryl, I mean, wh where's the, that? What's the jump? Unless 70 million of it, wait a second, unless 70 million of it was some, then we voted on a water. If I remember. That's that show up here. That was a bond. That was a bond. That was a bond. That that was a bond. That, bond is dead. That's an enterprise bond. It's, it's different. It that shows up. So, where's the set of books? You all get on now. Uh, very good points. Um, there is a somewhat uh, involved calculation to arrive at these numbers for what's counted and what's not counted. Uh, the simplest way I can put it is that that table is looking at the general obligation bonds of the city that the general fund pays for. 2011, or the projection as of June 30, 2011, looks skewed because it includes bonds authorized but not yet issued. So there are projects that council has approved that we haven't borrowed for. That's the difference between the 40% number and the 50%. When were they approved? Over previous years. Before we came, before July 1 last year. Yes, it seems cold. It does get cold. It was four or five years. We prior to multiple years for the fire project. So those are all, so they're finally coming in. I mean, I guess. They have to draw yes, that. No, they're going to start. You're going to start to draw the money and start to have city borrows on a cash flow basis. Right. So depending on individual project cash flows, we borrow as needed. So, that would be so we have projects that council has approved in prior years that haven't uh, received funding. So like the court building, authorized but unissued. Right. So, so this is authorized but but unissued. This is the 54 percent that's shown in the table. Right is those bonds that are outstanding as well as the authorization uh, that have not been issued yet. And so since you sell, sell on, a cash, as, on a cash flow basis, uh, prior to selling the authorized and unissued, some will be retired. Yes. And, and so that for the amount outstanding, that this is not the, the number of the uh, percentage of the amount outstanding. The 54% is not net. <coughs> you just give your way. <coughs> Three, almost 45%. You've just given us a true snapshot of everything. Yes, and the, the critical point for this He's table given us the worst is case. Is what it is. is that that's it. everything. That yeah. stuff that's falling off. I understand. Off, I understand. Yeah. But it's the worst case. It assumes that all of the projects that council has previously approved were issued. Right. Um, which hasn't happened. Uh, and yes, we have debt service payments throughout the year, so we're always taking steps down. And we, we're all on a very conservative basis with level principal. So when we pay off debt, we're paying off pretty sizable chunks. Right. So if you try and do the walk from year to year, you'll see that using 2010, we issued additional bonds. We didn't go up by the amount that we issued. We went up by about 70% of them because of what we retired throughout the year. Well, let me ask you this. Was that our standard practice the way we presented this prior to? You come here to be present this in such that way. 
Uh, I'd have to look back. Okay. That would be really interesting. Give you some history of how uh, this was reported. I think something that, that is missed, and I know you mentioned the courthouse, but something that's missed is, is and I, I think it, and I, when, the, when the new courthouse is constructed, you have to consider that you have the old courthouse that gets torn down. The old courthouse that gets torn down, I mean, that there's an asset there to be sold, that land can be sold sure. developed. And I think that that is something that is, that is missed. And I don't know if we have a plan for that at this time. Is that something that all that's in the works? Um, uh, Andy, we have, we've had probably three or four plans on the board about how that property might be used in the future that include development sites, right. includes taking Main Street Come all the way across yeah, so you don't to Harbor Park. Park. <laughs> you know, that was when development was really booming. Probably have to readjust our thinking, you know, and that all, but that we've got, um, we've got some really nice looking stuff. But, and I think that, I think something that's forgotten is that that where the courthouse is basically could become, you know, almost a four corner. Well, would be. that's it. I think what, what, what I'm thinking of is this, is that when the courthouse comes, the new courthouse goes up, the old courthouse comes down, is that you have an asset. No, you only have the circuit court that you have an asset. You're not, that land that the general district court is on. You're right, not, that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, you're not going to right be here. here. Right. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'm saying right here on St. Paul Boulevard, right. the circuit court building, as you take it all the way to Waterside Drive, is a huge marketable asset that can generate revenue. The way we're currently set up, we don't have that. It's an opportunity call. It's an opportunity for revenue. And therefore, I think that that would help if it's projected. I know that we can at least project that now, is what occurs is, is that defrays the cost of what that courthouse really is. Because you have an opportunity now for development on that site. I think that's forgotten. I think it, 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 you know, getting it out now is significant. Being able to have the cameras there and get that out now is significant. And that needs to be understood that you may have a courthouse that is partially paid for already. And you have another, you know, hundred million to go, whatever it is, whatever that amount is now, as we develop it. But you will have an opportunity to sell and develop the site of the old courthouse as an opportunity to generate revenues. And that's been that was lost in the shuffle. And uh, we should have something here. What's that? We need to show you the plan. Yeah, we need to see the plans. <laughs> Because, but it's, but see, that plan is not in here. It's lost because it's it's not seen as. I think that perhaps if you took that and said courthouse, uh, certain right. courts done at a certain time, that asset should be then moved onto the books here. Yeah, and it should be shown as an asset to defray whatever that cost would be. It's exactly and that right. helps taxpayers understand it better because right now it's only understood as. We've got more debt coming. And that's one of the reasons we were we went <coughs> vertical with the courthouse. Right. Exactly. Well, that's, that's what everybody's doing now. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, everybody goes that. But what I'm saying is, it does the asset of that building. Even though we show the we show the debt of the building, you don't show the asset of the building in your budget. Does that make sense? It does. How and can I, you do that? Well, I, you're yes. going to have to figure out some cost of what or availability of what that site is worth. <coughs> The value of that site. Well, we're talking about way. the site where the circuit court. Where the circuit court is sitting, exactly. you know, all the way right. down down St. Paul's. Right. And we've we've divided it up in different plans, three or four different ways, or one large user, or but it is definitely going to be a development site. Right. Uh, right. So right you got to wrap it around the corner of Waterside yeah. and and, well, and like St. Paul's. For the courthouse, it? Well, but I mean, but well, I you know, in in the full <laughs> argument, all of that ought to ought to be understood. And, right. and again, I just and I know all the courthouses are going vertical now. But when this thing started getting planned, this courthouse went vertical, so we could save as much development space as possible right. by going up in the air. Well, some people lobbied for for grass cutting. I'm lobbying for a courthouse. <laughs> Okay, but, well, but I think we, we need to a, show the asset. But I mean, if, if you're going to say that for budget, then you got to add all of the potential properties that are coming back onto the city side as assets. So yeah, I don't think you can't limit it just well, to. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps yeah. we can. What's the value of that <laughs> yeah, site? I mean, we've got the schools libraries. that are coming back to us. And, right, uh, exactly. Yeah. You look at the value of what that site is. Look at the value of those schools that come back online. It's almost like we're cheating ourselves on assets that we have, and it's. And I'm not saying don't be conservative. I'm just saying that we need to fully, if we're going to have a budget that's 500 pages, then we need to go back and find a way to place a value upon those assets that come back to us. 
Kelly, and that's about, good. You need to be very conservative. It should be. It should very be. Conservative. But I think that, but that at least puts it here and it can be seen. Right now it can't be seen. It's just, I mean, I could put a value on an asset that's there, a building. Right. But if I tear that building down, I don't know how you put an asset on something that's not there. Wait, put the, take the building down. Put an asset, make it what is it? Land the million, the land back. Oh, yeah, I know that, yeah, but, but right now talking, that doesn't. It's vertical. not showing. I'm not, I'm not saying vertical. She's talking about. She's talking about the residue when right. everything's built out. Right. There's going to be a piece of property over right. there that has value, and then we don't show that, and then that that value force can be anything that a developer wants to put into it that we're willing to do. Um, Are we going to give them the land? And I'll, 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 I'll wait to my next turn. Okay, okay, Only if it's IBM and they bring five thousand. A couple of things. Uh, right. I noticed. You're right. It's got a good view of the water. I mean, it's right. a perfect site. It backs up to uh, Arbor Park where the rail systems are. You, you people can walk to light rail and can walk to the inner city. Right. Next up. A uh, couple of things. A lot of talking. Uh, we're still going to keep going around, right? Jump around a little bit. We have in our budget funding uh, preliminary engineering three million three hundred fifty-eight thousand, whatever. And it, it, is that that for our engineering? And I read it as for our people in house. Yes, sir. So that, is that on top of uh, personnel costs? Yep. Um, <laughs> what happens that you can do this a bunch of ways? I think maybe eight years ago or so, the city decided to take those personnel costs and charge them to the project in which they're working on in the capital improvement plan. You could as easily take Does that. take that off of the, of the cost of personnel? Yes, sir. I it's yeah. being charged to that particular budget in the capital improvement plan. So it does reduce the cost on the operating side. Do we do that in any other department just an engineer? Uh, it's just public reports related to preliminary engineering. And you That's could customary. I mean, I know we've done it. I just, just I, I don't quite understand. We're just taking money out of, you know, labor, or not, you know, personnel costs, and putting them in a. Um, and, and charge it to the project. And, and I can tell you that you can well, argue we're both sides. We're sticking money over to the project. We're basically saying that that staff is working on that project, so therefore the project is paying for that staff's time on the project. You could make a case to say, don't do preliminary engineering, have it all on the operating side, and John is trying to. Yeah, uh, I mean, it is commonly done in other agencies. Yeah, the Corps of Engineers, the Navy, BDOT, uh, all charge their kind of like cost their personal overhead. capital. Yeah. Okay, I'm just, it's interesting to me that we would do it. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Uh, Jumping around a little bit, I noticed we have funding for both stop and the second chances for in a couple of places. CPDG. Are you do you have confidence in the leadership for the stop and the second check? We dug into that and we got you know. so um, the council when there are, are a, um, a number of uh, operations for both the stop and the second chance. And I think if you go to stop, I think it's something like administration, maybe $12,900. Yeah, but there's more. And, and more so for second chances. What we did is that the programs and services that we're currently getting, um, we treated that much like. Second chance is 435000 Right. And it's 12, 9, one place, and I think CBT, we got them. Fix them up, yes, sir. Um, the level of confidence, we, I, for me to say that we've done a thorough analysis of every single. Um, one of our outside partners, definitely not. What we, I did mention last week in um, the, the message is that everybody that gets money from us now is not just they're going to get a letter from the budget director that says, here's your $12,900. Please do exactly what you said you're going to do in your application. We're asking for uh, quarterly, we're asking for quarterly uh, revenue and budget projections and updates. Well, more than 12000 but I just want to be sure, based on our you know, experience, that we are comfortable with the management, the management techniques. Not only that, but everybody will 
Sure. And to answer your question directly, um, it's all going to depend on what we start to get when they start reporting quarterly to us, as well as their year-end projections, because I will be first to say the process has been, in many cases, a letter that basically says, here's the money, and we hope that you do exactly what you said you would do, as opposed to uh, having quarterly reports back to the administration. I for the CBD years, Right. Right. Now, under the CDBG part, there's a bit more um, stringent review. When you start to get into what we call outside agencies, um, again, we believe in just being very uh, open with this discussion is that we need to improve because it really has been a letter with here's your money. And, and, and I'll, one more now, Bill, the, the Chodos, Watch very carefully. Which size? Community, Community housing development. Could you help Councilman win with some of the, the and, ways and that we're monitoring? As a secondary part of that, we've got a budget item here, like 83000 that says remaining Chodo set aside. What is that? Okay, the home program with Chodo, you are required to do is 15% set aside. And we have, um, can you speak up a little bit? Sure. We have paid 15% set aside that's required for our Chodo, um, Chodos. Um, over the years, we've um, increased the number of children that we've had. We, there was a time when we had four, we're now down to two. We can write in a line. So in a, because the requirement is there, we have to set aside um, funding. We put a set-aside amount for children that may come online during the program year. So for example, um, we can just speak up here talking about the stop organization because it's for some interest in performing children duties for the city. So if the stop organization were to be certified as a young child during this program year, we would have funds already allocated and we would have to put that in our claim hood and be able to allocate some money. We typically we use those funds. We do this every year. We do this every year. Do we, do we typically use them? We do use them. We do have years where um, some properties have been slower than others and the funds do go over over a period of time. But we do allocate the funds out there. We've had none, none, none. Now we've got 80. Well, let me ask you a question on that page. You know, how many children do we have now? Two. Two. Beacon Light and Plumline. Park, well, we had Park, we had Park, Park I guess they went out of business. How, 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 how much money do you allocate for Plumline? About 320 equipment. Plumline is 132, and Beacon Light is 186. All right, what page are you on? On page 464. You know, we, 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 we haven't been doing it, but you say typically we do it. We, we have funded them the last three years, and we haven't. Why are we doing that? And we have it for I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I've, I've had an issue, but I mean, you know, when I look at, they, they serve a, a necessary purpose, but when you look at some of these communities today that couldn't attract uh, uh, quality developers into them, uh, and that was the nexus of, of trying to provide a, an opportunity for builders to come into these communities so they create children. But now that, we have like uh, we have and uh, we have a guild, you know, with North Development Housing Authority for the, the properties that they own, uh, and I think that no community should be treated different. And so, if such and such builder is willing to go over here, he should be willing to come over here as well. And we're seeing that we're seeing that we got builders that would normally go in certain communities now are building in these communities. And so my question has always been. You know why do we continue to, uh, you know, uh, to fund these chodos? And at the end of the day, all they are is a middleman. You know, because all they pass that cost on to the consumer, right? And so, to me, that 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 hurts. If I'm trying to if I'm trying to provide affordable housing, and I get the middleman out of the way, that's five or six more thousand dollars or more house than I can afford. You know, so why do we continue to do that? Well, I've been fighting that issue in Central Brampton as it relates to that. That you know, we gonna get, we gonna use the gill. You got a gill in place. We gonna get a quality product, and we gonna save some, some somebody some money, you know, to be able to uh, afford the house and get a quality product. The reason we use children's like it said now is because the HUD regulation required that we have to use the community housing authorization. What we probably need to re-examine is how we contract with them and the types of the way we do business with them and how we want to negotiate the terms of their agreement so that less money goes necessarily to their administrative costs and more money can be subsidized to the home buyer. Right, and because you get in a situation where you got communities that said to to, to me as being their, their council person, look, 
uh, I want the economic diversity within my community. You continue to build low to moderate homes in my, in my community. We can't attract nor sustain any type of uh, uh, retail or commercial development within this community because you continue to take a, a census tract that's already impacted and continue to impact. So to me, at some point, we got to look at that and understand that it is, it, is, it, it is important to be able to provide parity within these communities. Yes. And so, yeah. Um, one thing I would say, in addition to um, what uh, Council Member Prince is indicating, that what you're saying is exactly right, the way we need to, to go about this. We can't use the CHOTO tool as a tool to do it. We have to look for other development and other Right, that's what I'm saying, right, right. Do but the but through North Korea, through North Korea Development and Housing Authority, we were, we were fortunate enough in 2005 to create a guild, okay, a housing guild. Not every developer that builds anything, whether it's in East Beach or Broad Creek or wherever, uh, they have to be in that guild. They have to be approved. Uh, deal member to be able to go uh, to uh, to uh, uh, apply for any RFPs that go out. But what they've done in the past with these children, they ask, "Well, look, give me a few lots," you know, and they they don't have to go through the scrutiny of these others. We've had problems with ACS and some of these other folks, and so all I'm saying today that we need to treat all these communities the same. One more question. You're saying if we're required to put how much? 15% of our entitlement allocation. Okay, we put 50%. So why is that? 50% of your time. You got Plumb Line getting 88, Beacon Line getting 90. That's 180,000. That's ridiculous. And our allocation for our is 1.79 million from HUD. So you're looking at the allocation, the 1.7 million. 15% of all of the HUD gives us for this. Account. For the home program, yes. What are we going to Okay, what are we going to this do? This basically goes, goes well, we, we haven't done it the personnel week. costs, so to speak. Yeah, that's what it pays. It, it, it we provides a... We yeah. have to do it. We, we didn't do it the last three years. It's a lot of change. Mm -hmm. no. I, I, I think, uh, Councilman, the, where the confusion is, um, we're picking up funds in 11, and you're saying that there was no funds in the last three years on page 464. I'm looking... At FY10, we didn't have any remaining should have set aside. FY11, we didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Damn FY12, it. you're proposing no. 83,000. What we're doing, I'm sorry. What so we're we doing. broke the law or be No, no, no. With the children, we, we had higher amounts when we didn't do that. We had higher amounts on the speaking right and plumb line in those years. And Park Place Redevelopment Foundation was also a children at the time. So now, this year, we've created a subcategory for an organization that may not be approved at this at this so moment. This is new. The, this is not something we've done every year. This is new. The category for children set aside is something we've done every year. This the, What's new this year is that we're putting it aside for an organization that may come online during the program year. But tell me something. If they build absolutely nothing, okay, they still yeah. keep that money. Yeah. And they, that's called operating. The operating costs. Well, yes. what are they operating if they're not building anything? Working with developers, working in their office, we're paying for things like utilities for them. Um, well, their office, they, where are their offices? Do they have, I mean... They, they each have offices located here in Norfolk, separate, you know, um, official well, offices. But, but then again, we have to look at that because there's nothing in Central Bramington that we're going to do outside of our feet. So what is the operation cost? Uh, what, what's associated with operation, what, what an operation cost when you're not building anything? Just, I mean, just like you said, just the marketing and trying to work with developers. And How can you work with a developer if the developer is not in a deal and that, that ace, whoever that group is or that children has to, 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 to uh, be in the guild and, and they're not in the guild? The children are not. In the right. And, and, and so they have to, to um, and they try to, I, I can only speak to one, but they try to fight on this, but have to, uh, the same way we do business anywhere else, they, they have to apply when the RFP goes out. So my question is, like, the children who don't apply to kids, I understand, I understand that, but we've stopped. Right. We don't have to give them land. No, we don't. Right. We don't have to give them land. So you just said that it was that, that uh, through some federal government or something, we have to do a 15 percent set aside. Set aside what? What do we have to set aside? 
we have to set aside the funds, but if there's no opportunity to build, we're setting aside the funds to do, right, to do what? We're just giving Again, away money. Like I mentioned earlier, we may have to re-examine how sure. we're going about sure. doing this. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting the data. I know, I know. But I just want to understand I just, because, I, I mean, this, this, yeah. this has been happening too long. And I know that, you know, in, in dealing with the community and, 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 and uh, the wishes and having a planned community and not just this type of development. And I know they haven't built much right. in the last few years. So yes. they've been getting this money that goes towards operation. Are we, as an administration, looking at those dollars and saying, look, you know, why are we paying you $88,000, but right. we're not building nothing? Can I add one thing? Like, you know, one of, and, and your point is well taken. <coughs> one of the things that we are doing in HUD is actually working with us is to identify organizations that have better capacity, stronger capacity to do this. Um, we've traditionally in you know, used local shows, local organizations, but there's nothing in the HUD guidelines that says that there's a stronger entity that maybe in Richmond that has the capacity to come in and truly develop the partnerships that are necessary, that they couldn't come in and build and help us develop these um, housing units that we're looking for. So we've been actually working with our HUD representatives to put together some training so that we can identify potential organizations that can come in and do the things that we need here. On the budget line it says home buyer assistance. It says they requested 740, yeah. but we're giving them 1.2 or we're why are we giving That's them a half like a million this. dollars more than what they asked? When the, the mission, when the budget came in from the housing authority initially, that was the um, that was how they um, categorized their request. But as the as we went back and worked with them over it, they realized that home buyer assistance is a greater need. It's a program that typically runs out of funding for the years out. This is the program that provides down payment and closing cost assistance to new home buyers. Well, that's Spark. a good program. No, that's it's a good program. Program. No, it's not Spark. Spark, Spark, is, Spark. is an additional pot of money that yeah, we need. Really uh, but this is not Spark. So we pull my question, my else. point is on this. I mean, I think we're seeing council-wide that we are totally perplexed by what this is. I mean, the values are up, down. I'm not saying anything's wrong. But it's, it's very unclear on what these agencies do, why their funding is up and down here today, not here tomorrow. I really think council would benefit from some clarification. Because my point was what Tommy said, uh, there was one Virginia supportive housing. It was here. It was gone. It was here. Um, I, I really, I mean, unless somebody else has got all this figured out. Well, HomeNet is a great program. I didn't say it is. I'm just saying as uh, some clarification. And I think, Marcus, that's been your goal sure, on right. this, is to demonstrate, A, if they're doing the right job, if they're um, showing us that their funding has been used appropriately. I, I support all of that with what you're doing. But I think this speaks to exactly what we're qu questioning and is difficult for us to adequately assess. Um, so maybe if. I mean, if you all agree, maybe just to get further clarification sure. next week on why this is um, as unclear as I think sure. it is. Well, I think everybody it's else. No, I, 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 we, we have not had a presentation on, <coughs> on these block of these grants. Half these of us didn't even know it showed a what. Well, I, I tell you <laughs> and something. I'll be yeah. 15 or 20, you know, 30 minutes yeah. on these. Good. And, Good. and there Good. are Good. some of these, as, as um, Terry said, I mean, some of the numbers have changed radically. This um, rapid exit program went from 200,000 to 25. I'm sure there's a good reason for that. Yeah. But that's a, that's a homeless stabilization program. And um, we're way back at very end, 462. It's it's behind the last tab. Sure. They're trying to. Yeah, as I'm saying, and then back up. But there's probably good reasons for all of this, and we don't want to. You know, we just want to. We just want answers. We're not going to pick all. Of, we can't do all of it. Right now. But, but what I can tell you, I can tell you this 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 particular program here. This is the home ownership program. Now that's one of those programs that we see families move from rental to to home ownership throughout the city. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see that, but that that Maybe that. They move that up in the homeowner right. But but they got other they got other funds. Well, let, they, let's they, have they, somebody sure. explain all yeah. that. Sure. And, and I can tell you, Council, what typically happens. Program. It's that um, in some years 
this is a part of the budget in the notebook in some years it's not. I mean, this is a part this of the budget. This is sometimes I wish it had been. Yeah, had been. <laughs> and typically what we do is we give you just a briefing on CDBG by itself before you We normally get this. a separate book. Yes, sir. But this is the safety net that a lot of people depend on. Oh, yeah. You know, and well, so we're not we absolutely in the program. Have, you but know, there's a reason it's on page 464. <laughs> <laughs> You're hoping to wear us back. <laughs> okay, let, let's keep going. All right, I had a question on an earlier page, and that is on the CIP five-year plan summary um, for under schools with the, on uh, 359. So um, construct or renovate schools <coughs> You know, we're projected ahead, 16 million, then proposed is nine, and then, could you, how many schools are we talking sure. about, essentially? Is there is there a game plan? And yes. The, um, boy, I gotta say this. Basically, uh, there is a game plan. It's not a game plan that I'm comfortable with. Um, you say you are? I'm not. Okay. Um, so let's start. The, the concept would be, we would hope that Crossroads is the model. In other words, that we just don't build schools to build schools. In other words, schools are community assets. Can you have a, a part of a rec center in a school? Can you have a part of a library in a school? So I think it's, I, I know it's very important to, going forward that we just don't look at a school for school's sake because we're going to build libraries, we're going to build rec centers, things of that nature. Um, why I say I'm not comfortable with the numbers is that um, I, I think we're fine with it. Um, I could go on the Department of Education's website right now, and they can suggest <coughs> that you can build a school uh, cheaper than what we have here. Um, you know, sometimes you get an elementary school for, let's say, $15 million. What this plan suggests that each school is $22 million. <coughs> some are K-8, through some are um, K-5. through five. So that's why I say I'm not comfortable. But, once we, but I believe there's capacity to get this done. So having said that, with these numbers, what you will see in FY12 is the completion of Crossroads and beginning funding for the next school. Okay. But that will be nine million dollars as opposed to the proposed sixteen. Right. So, it, in other words, what? Yeah. Right. The whole no, I know. Yeah. But nine million satisfies satisfies Crossroads costs and also puts aside money for for the next school. Yes. Yes. So even with the net next school, as Daryl was saying earlier, there are you know, millions and millions of funds. Um, that have previously been allocated. For instance, there's $2.25 million years ago that deals with the school on the, house, on the south side. Okay, so there's some capacity there. So as you move forward, basically what you're going to see is something along the lines of a $22 million school. And what you'll see is the overlap. And we'll start off with Crossroads. That's complete, so we'll count that one. <clears throat> you'll have two more schools in this five-year plan that are complete. And you'll have the fourth school that we have at least started the funds for the planning. Would we have loved to have five, six, seven, you name it, sure. But the concept here is that there's enough funds to uh, take care of, finish Crossroads, get the next two schools built, as well as get that fourth school, um, the, the planning money. My hope is that um, that $22 million per school, once we start to refine it, once we really start to have discussions with NPS, we, we have talked. But I don't have any documents. And I don't mean that negatively. This, this whole thing about well managed government, we should be able to sit down and say, for a K through five school, the cost is on average this. For a K through eight school, the cost is on average this. But this is enough capacity to finish Crossroads, get the next two done, and get that fourth one, at least some of the planning money. Is there any really lottery started. funds coming in anymore? Sure. No. I think it's used for technology and things like that. It's not used, it used for. Used to be used for cap. All right, and then the, other, the they, other quick thing was um, I'm eagerly anticipating the, the uh, uh, summary that's going to be presented to council about, about flooding. But I've noticed that in at least two instance, instances, money has been set aside to work on neighborhood and citywide flood funding, flooding. And I, I'm curious where we came up with those numbers and how can we plan for money to be spent for flooding if we don't even know what we anticipate is needed or should be done? Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Wibley, I think that the first thing is that I, I'm, I've had, had a chance to be um, 
briefed um, on a preliminary basis on the study that we can bring to um, the infrastructure committee this month. Um, and I'll tell you that there's not enough money in the CIP to address everything that you're going to see in that. But I will say that what the process, the principle was, um, there's money in the stormwater fund that's related to flooding. And maybe four or five years ago, there became a um, general fund contribution to in the CIP is playing also about a million five. Um, the concept would be that in those funds, that's a starting point. The study's going to tell us a lot. Um, John is John Kipe is prepared to really start to look at study flooding at threefold. One is there's some things that we can address. There's some things that while we may address a certain type of flooding, it's going to put us back in a place where no one's happy. And then there's that third piece that is going to take a long time and a lot of money. Um, so having said that, there isn't anything that's specific that says, hey, new project, $10 million as it relates to flooding. But there's been a buildup, and there have been some dollars associated with flooding in at least two accounts for a number of years. But I don't think, and I, you want to follow up, but I, I, Marcus, I never anticipated that the city itself would fight back the ocean. <laughs> you know, that we, then this was going to be, uh, something that you know the federal the, the Corps of Engineers was going to have to uh, be a part of federal dollars I mean we need to survey the landscape to see I mean they have spent billions in New Orleans in, in a city that is not much more at risk than we are you know and with our important military communities here there are very few communities more important to the welfare of this country than Hampton Roads and so uh, even you know so not the concept of us going it alone. Right. No, I mean, right. I never, I mean, I fully expected that we would be seeking, I mean, huge amounts of federal dollars to, to help uh, handle this. Uh, I mean, we can handle some, but some of the flooding, obviously, we're, we're going to have to, you know, address ourselves, but the large bulks of it in, in places that uh, we're, we are just you know, swamped ought to be federal money. And, and other communities get it. You know, they're just very aggressive. Well, I think that once we get the plan, right, that's, that's where, where we right. take it to Ridge. Or we take but it to I, I heard him trying to say we well, got a million here and no, a million there. And you, I mean, this is we're talking we're about serious money. Talking, yeah, hundred million. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was curious how we came up with one point two million, and then I was wanted to be satisfied that if in fact we put one point two million, that that money wasn't put towards something that ultimately wouldn't be effective anyway. Um, you know, so basically, it's just it's. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of improving anything we can do for our stormwater. That's really kind of a separate issue. But, um, anyway, I, I just was a little perplexed on how you pulled 1.2 million out of your hat. And, and, and it's been this steady funding over time, and we just didn't reduce it. Anthony, anything else? Yeah, um, I was looking back at that, and uh, I guess we do got to get some clarity about what we were saying earlier, because I've just realized HomeNet is over here, and that is the home ownership program. Yeah. But then they got this, there's this new home uh, home ownership program. So I don't know what that is. I don't know if that, that uh, hiring new staff people. I don't know if that's uh, associated with uh, smooth move and local circle and, and uh, the folks that are just relocating would have the training. So that that would be important to know because I do want to make sure that uh, we that they are putting uh, in place the infrastructure for people to, to to have the real opportunity to come back. And that means they have to put that, that in place. Um, what Teresa was saying earlier about this flooding, I noticed this is two two places here. You have uh, have, you have address street flooding, and then you had neighborhood flooding. And what's the difference? Is one, you know, is one, um, I, I can, is, is one somewhat infrastructure type work, or? I, I'll, I'll tell you what the, the principal was using. <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean that has to be the principle going forward. There was money associated uh, with flooding 
in the Seattle Gun Storm War. Years ago, because there were so many issues out here about flooding, it became a new project under the general fund, about a million five a year, also for flooding. I will tell you that that money hasn't moved um, much like one would expect. So it wasn't like you put a million five in and boom, you'd see a project that's done. Right. There's plan, plans for At those funds. At this point in time, that's good news. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. But so I just want to understand what he's saying is we keep yeah, it. How, how, you know, it, it, two pots. Sure. Is it two different uses, sure. or you could, sure. you, you could, you could, John will sit over there, so I'm sure John is you know, on the edge of his seat. John would sit over there and say, well, the stormwater is pretty clear. There's been a process for years. That other million five that's related to the general fund was something that said, wait a second, what can we do over and above what we already have planned? And so, again, the good news is that we have a new, I hate said good news is we have moved this quickly. But the good news is that we do have some capacity there to do some things. So if I need another BMP, we can get it. <laughs> uh, Marcus is correct, though, that we saw, I mean, there is front money in the stormwater fund, but it wasn't sufficient, so the other project was added in general. They've done a fair amount of work. Did you see all that money in the front for infrastructure? Yeah. Don't make me. Don't make me. <laughs> okay. All right. I that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Angela. The only other thing I have is, it's a um, and you all probably got them too, is the conservation issue with Ocean View and Pinewell and funding that. There's been a couple of issues. I don't exactly understand. I know we just added Pinewell to the conservation area. So it seems to me like the <coughs> funding would be based on the area without Pinewell and then we add Pinewell at a, you know, at a later, or add additional funds for Pinewell at a later date, but I'm not, I'm not clear on, they're asking for more money, I'm not clear on because some of them have already started applying for the I'm money and they've been told, that. they've been told that there is no money. So no, there is no money to shoot. Yeah. Still on the sideline for another year. So it is. <laughs> just, I mean, how? What do you mean? They're, they're finding that housing authority for what sort of work? Like for the individually to their homes to, to start renovating their homes. I mean, so right, grants? Yeah, right after we. The home, the I guess somebody from the housing authority is telling them there's no money. And maybe they're talking about for this fiscal year, right. because we just added them for for grants, home renovation, homes. and things like that. conservation. So, yeah, so yeah, the home improvement. Right. They, they apply for these low interest, well, these loans. They loans. Get qualified. Yeah. Right. Sort of loans that you do the that go that get right. They don't have to pay, pay back, back until right. right. Yeah, right. and if they sell the house, you know, yeah. But they're that saying, but they're asking for for fully. I mean, everything government funded runs out at the end of the. I mean, we're at the end of the fiscal year, so I'm not money. understanding. I think they're asking exactly. for money for next. This fiscal year yeah. coming up in July. Okay. Uh, they understand they're not. But that comes out of the housing authority. Yeah, that, that's, sure. a, that, so. that's a program. Is that a $4 million housing yeah. authority? That's a program okay. if you get the designation. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it doesn't require you to be funded at any given time. Basically, it is you have to qualify. It may be two or three city, people in there to qualify. It may be it's a citywide. Yeah, it's a yeah, citywide initiative, and so yeah, I mean, it's not designated just for right. Money. It's not like a neighborhood type thing where everybody's going to get money. You have to meet a threshold. Certain you have to be like thirty percent of AMI, or something like that. So you know, it's. Uh, well, I understand what the requirements are in terms of individuals getting it, but my question is just they're sending emails asking about the funding source. Right. And, and that's where my question is, is the, is the funding source. Because there's several of those conservation neighborhoods and, and, and things like that that are able to get low interest loans and you do have to qualify, but the source is, I guess, what I'm asking about. The federal government. Well, it can, it can, just real quick, I am partly correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe when we were working this out with the neighborhood, that it was explained to them that they were being put in a pot with all the other neighborhoods and that the money was not going to change. Okay. And because That's of the fiscal asking. year ending, okay. that... They're lobbying to get a piece of the Right. Okay. Just like right. any okay. other neighborhood. Okay. That's what they want. So it might just be, right. like that's, I said, they're calling the housing authority. They're being okay. told it's not there. 
because the money for this fiscal year is probably the pie has been gone. Yeah, it'll okay. be so a new pie next year. Next, in July. So they will we'll start over. Okay. If I'm going to be involved, that's right. Funds we have for the conservation throughout the city. Okay. That's what they yeah. All right. That's the question. I, that's the question I'm asking. Okay. I'm good. When you look at that as a ward issue. Ward. It's not that big of a neighborhood. It's good. And it's limited by income. <laughs> and if they start doing repairs based on the grant they might get, and that's not exactly uh, that's right. wise. Right. That's really not wise to start doing repairs they on the house based on something that, yeah. that you might receive. So. Okay, Tommy. Sure. Um, and just to let everybody know, I um, met with Marcus this morning and shared um, some concerns and questions because I was in, I knew I was going to be late today for the school. This is my job. Um, and so I got a lot of that. I do have oh, just, to work. I know, can't work. Um, I just have Speak a, for yourself. a few that uh, might be of interest for some uh, other council members. Um, this issue with the police recruit money, and um, I brought it up with the previous administration. I, I brought it up with this administration. I still have not received a response. I know Anthony has been on it. I know Angela's been on it. And, you know, I saw the website, the City of Norfolk website, that promised this to the employees. I've been told there's a lot more information out there that we don't know about, but I saw it, the website. And I think that it's we're going on almost three years now since this was promised to our police officers, and I'd like to see us put this to rest. And I, I didn't see it addressed in the budget, and maybe it is, um, but I, it, it's not going to cost us that much to give these police officers what was promised to them. You understand? Yeah, that's right. Sure. Right. If you took them back, they would lose more. Sure. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me, we can't hear over here, please. I'm having a sidebar. Okay, let's keep going. Um, and just wanted your, your opinion about the auditor's office and, um, you know, with the, the new fraud hotline, they've taken on some some other cases. In, in your professional opinion, do you think that the staffing we have there is adequate to handle the, the caseload and what we need to address the issues that we've seen in our city? Or could we beef it up to find more places where we can save money? Right. Um, uh, Council Smeagol, um, because I don't have the data in front of me, I, I couldn't tell you whether or not um, they need you know, more staff or not. Um, what I will say is that John and I had a conversation, I guess it was yesterday, about the hotline and about um, how he can close out cases. And some of that's going to revolve around more discussions between John's office and, and me. So um, I can't say right now, I'm very supportive, very supportive of, uh, of John. I'm very supportive of trying to make sure we have an efficient organization. Um, I do believe that, unless I'm missing something, that the whole process, um, how the administration would interact with the auditor's office, how we go about, um, how he releases reports, how we work together, I, I don't think that that has been really the thought process has been put together. As a matter of fact, we're going to meet on Monday and try to um, work out some of those steps. I know I didn't answer your question directly. I just don't have the, the data, sure. but I'm very supportive no, of John. It. I just, you know, I, I don't know what a city our size, what a, a good auditor's office, you know, what they should have. You know, and sometimes it's just the quality of the people, too. It's not necessarily the quantity. But yeah, sure. Richmond, do you sure. know how big their auditor's office uh, is? Much bigger than I would ever want this one to be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the Richmond auditor is, basically is completely IG. self Okay. Uh, I mean, he is an inspector general. He, is. he uh, is he elected? Um, no, he's appointed, but he okay. is. Uh, he doesn't report to anybody but the public. You know, he fights with the council and the manager and the, and the mayor routinely. And um, this uh, auditor, by our charter, is appointed by the council and reports to us. And it's it's uh, most instances, most cities. In Virginia, and the auditor will report to the manager, and uh, so we, we have a, a different type of a person here. And I, my guess is you will find throughout Virginia and cities our size, the auditors function. There's no standard 
number of employees? That's a good question, Tom. Yeah, yeah it's right. really. Well, and, and I haven't talked to John about this idea, and I don't know if this is done elsewhere, but are there any are there cases where we can hire part-time employees to assist with special projects um, if something bigger comes up through and then he can bring on staff that would work just on that project maybe even former employees you know that can come in and that way it doesn't pull away from what he's already currently working on with this annual review of different departments and then when something big comes in then he's got to pull his staff to go um, and do, you know, work on that project. Sure. I would hope that um, John looks at um, the resources that he has as being 4,000 plus. In other words, if there's some issues out there, I would love for him. John and I talked about this before I came back. I'd love for us to have collaborative efforts if we're all out here trying to make sure we have a well-managed government. There's no reason why we can't have a cross um, functional team that works together to work out some um, to, to get some efficiency. So I would hope that that's you know I hope it's this train of thought's the same as it was five years ago that we can really get some synergy by having him work with us. Well, let, me, some key let, me, let me piggyback. You know, his um, since we did this broad outline, his his uh, duties and his role has expanded. Uh, at some point, just like I was asking Vernon some time ago, that we need uh, root up updates. Uh, if he's working on case, I think this is kind of it's real sensitive because although he's appointed by us, he, he's supposed to uh, report to us, but he's dealing with personnel issues, meaning that he's dealing with his employees. And so I just think that there has to be. Uh, I, I think if we we have to set some as a council. Uh, set up that uh, that structure in terms of how information is is, is uh, 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 brought out because it's, it's very sensitive to us because personnel issues we, we've we don't done get a poor job as a right. council in uh, helping okay. getting uh, guidance to the right board. involved and so I just think that if he's if he's operating independent of the manager uh, I think that's a disservice because those are his employees at the end of the day well. But he's an, he's appointed by us. I, I understand and he, that. And his so and. But if we don't know, if we don't know what he's doing. Well, he has a an audit plan that he presents to a, a committee of the council every year. This gets approved, and, and uh, I mean, but it begs the the question: Is we've done a poor site, a poor job of oversight, or or even working with with the auditor as a council because we're also busy? It's somebody else doing sort of thing and nobody really was taking the thing on and uh, as a practical matter we've always seen we see the manager and the auditor as part of the team they and they work very closely together even though he's independent of the manager and that's they should have that sort of work. But that hadn't always been the issue here as you well know. No I know. Right. So I just say that right here's a, a great opportunity to, to begin to have that dialogue where it is a cohesive relationship, and that, uh, but at the same time, we do understand what's going on. Yep. At some point, we need to be, if there's these independent investigations that are going on, or audits that are taking place, that at some point, that, that, that comes in here, you know, and if it's sensitive because of it's a personnel issue, then at least he's brief, and we get some, uh, uh, some idea of what's going on. Yeah. If you can one, I have two, just two other issues, and then um, there was a concern. It was interesting. It was brought up this weekend. Uh, we demoed a small house in East Ocean View as part of the kickoff of the clean uh, cleanup efforts, um, and I found out. I was wondering. We acquired that property um, about two years ago and left this house there. When we acquire property, apparently we don't put money in for the demolition of that property when we acquire it. And I don't know if that's just a policy change in your administration or if it has to be addressed in the budget cycle. But it seemed to me that if we're going to acquire property, that and the point of it is to take it down, that we would go ahead and include in that money, um, demolition money to take it. You'll see that uh, Councilor Smigel and CIP the um, project that's I think a little north of a million dollars. This acquisition, we have demolition. In okay, case. so it's yes. built in. Okay, and then the other um, last thing was about beach replenishment, and I noticed that it went significantly lower this year. 
two point one million this year. Yeah, that's I think it was four million in last year's budget. So uh, the reduction is because we did a better job last year of moving the sand from Willoughby Spit down to the other end. No. Um, um, let's do it this way. Um, what happened is last year, if you go back to last year's capital improvement plan, you look at the out years, there were significant bump ups in a lot of projects. Right. Okay. Um, so again, last year, this time last year, um, you start to look at the size of the budget um, decrease, and you start to look at the second consecutive year of um, declines in real estate assessments. We just went back, hit the reset button, and said, you know, some of the things that happened last year, while they were great, if you go back to 2010, you would see it's back to where it was, about 2.1 million. So again, um, last year's budget development, you see the out years, there was this bump up in a bunch of projects, and we just tried to bring them back down to where they would have been in 10, or even lower. So 2.1 is typically what you would have seen for okay. future yes. And we're still going after federal funds? On yes. Yes, sir. How much of that, that those Fed funds have we gotten back to date? Uh, in the FEMA funds? Right. I think they told us last week a million seven. Out of the barrel. We got a million. We're still getting ready. We need another million three to come in. And that might be just related to the SAM replenishment? That's, which, well, that's just reimbursement to the city for overall. It's not just on the, But the, the total for including the response and debris was substantially more than that. But the, the federal government uh, has very strict uh, uh, guidelines for sand replenishment. Right, right, uh, right. So that's not that's only a small portion of the FEMA reimbursement. Right. But I just want to say too that um, I got a couple emails, phone calls, and text messages. People asked me where I was at the meeting because people are watching it on. Uh, <laughs> and so people are watching it. So and I had a job. Yes. And I, I hope that you put it money in the budget to pay for the electricity bill for these lights because they are very strong. I'm um, not shining just, off my <laughs> Maybe it's the glare. I would hope they'd be energy efficient okay, so we would on, be okay. decreasing our budget. Yeah, and, and as form of revenue raising, and I'm going to address this as city attorney. The statute, I think July 1, allows plaintiffs to file with a $25,000 cap in the general district court. There are currently uh, matters being held by uh, plaintiffs' lawyers to file in general district court as of July 1. That's going to tax the general district court quite a bit, and we should look at if it's possible to, I don't know if it's a, we have to go through the General Assembly, but we can do it uh, somehow to raise funds as a revenue raising fund, because that general support is going to be hammered with a lot of filings and a lot of work, and if there's any way that we can do some kind of filing tax, raise whatever we have in the General District Court uh, to support that work, because I can guarantee you they're going to need, ultimately at this time next year, they're going to need more people. And if there's any way we can make, uh, generate revenue off of that, because that is going to increase considerably the number of cases that are going to go through that courthouse. So if we can look into that, if we can do it on our own without having to go to Richmond, let's look at re raising revenue in this budget and see if we can get a line item in and what would be appropriate. Um, you know, that's an excellent the point. House. There may yeah. be some, some fees which we're not at the time. I know guys are holding their cases no, and they're just waiting. Um, Stanley, you may be able to help me on this one. Under the uh, sheriff in jail, um, it shows the regional jail, There, it looks like a $700,000 increase from 2010, another $400,000 increase from 2011. What are they doing? I mean, I'm on that board. I didn't hear this. Are they just sending us a bill? Yeah. Uh, our do, you know, do you remember? I don't know. Our share of the cost... Uh, while our share has not changed, the total cost has changed, and the uh, amount of per diem, because the state is lowering its right, per Right, I remember diem. that discussion. And so the cost per diem for each of the four member localities went up $4 per inmate okay. per day. And by the time you calculate it out, do the divisions, ours came out to that 700000 Are we? Is, are they taxing us per theoretical inmate? Or they tax us by who we by have there by actual. Okay. Um, P 
page 178. And, uh, and this is the CSB. I know Mr. Taylor, Dr. Taylor is here. But tell us, I mean, I'm looking at a cut, and if I'm right, is it a million from last year? Yes. From Norfolk's contribution? Yes. One, I know that you look, did you sit down with them and they had to justify their budget to you for CSB? Uh, we had staff to staff discussion. I did have a discussion with the executive director. The executive director came up with a plan of about $775,000 worth of cuts, which she believes that she could absorb. Right. Um, we have a million there. Um, I mentioned this to the executive director before we produced the, um, introduced the budget, the post budget to you that there would be a million dollar reduction. Right. Um, and the concept would be that there are a fund balances in this entire budget. And you know maybe you know, we have to spend more time presenting this to council. There have been a number of opportunities where people have fund balances. As I said, I want to protect this 5%. Tim, what's that? That's just, I give you money, some of my partners, and at the end of the year, your the resource you have or more than expenditures, it drops to your fund balance. Okay. Okay. Uh, even with some of our entities like Nauticus, um, the cruise terminal, which is now because of gas, 54, they're all in our, our general fund budget. Um, there have been over the years, um, for whatever reason, some it's state money, some it's federal, some it's local money, a number of entities that have their own fund balance built up, okay, um, to the tune of millions of dollars. So what you will see in this budget is even things like James Rogers' department, um, there it's a fund balance. So we say it instead of, would I call them out? Yeah, James. <laughs> James, 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 <laughs> and it's part, James but, was throwing that money away. But it was this partnership, you know, the, um, the bottom line is that dollars had accumulated in James. So they have a saving. Right. So instead of having the general fund contribute more money, We've said, can you go into your own fund balance to help us out? And that is across this entire enterprise this year, okay? With the CSB, um, there is a fund balance. So if you got to that first 775000 roughly, you know, the other, you know, 225 whatever number we get to it, um, the concept would be, could you use, let's say it a different way, the concept would be, please use your fund balance to help close that remaining. So that was the discussion with the executive director. There were more discussions with staff. I will tell you that one of the things that happens in this budget process, we give targets. We say, well, what could you do if you had to reduce 20%? What could you do if you had to reduce 40%? I heard at one point there was a 40% um, reduction scenario given to CSB. And I talked to Maureen, I said, whoa, <laughs> you, know, I, we, you know, that's just a, an exercise. No one ever expected for the CSB to um, have that type of reduction. What I will say is that we match more, and that was one of the conversations we had in this council, we provide much more than what's required of us as a match. So even if there wasn't this discussion about whether or not CSB could come um, into the administration, we believe that this was uh, similar to the way we treated a number of entities that had these fund balances going into a bunch of discussions. Well, can we? Can I go on just a minute now? and just following on what you just mentioned? What is your vision? And if we are to bring CSB sure. under City Hall, sure. Sure. and what savings are there? Sure. I, what, I guess that would be a future question as to right. savings. But what is your vision to bring them here so it can be understood? Sure. Um, a piece of it would be let's get first let's get the right people around the table, you know, the professionals, folks not just only in the city but across the state across the Commonwealth, even people from Richmond. And let's talk about this, because what's happening is there are 40 CSBs across the state. And basically, there are 11 CSBs that serve one jurisdiction. So you have some CSBs that serve a dozen, well, maybe, let's say 10 jurisdictions. Can you give an example? Um, Captain Newport News or one. Yeah, yes. okay, right. We'll York, I guess York and Williamsburg would be. They, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Sure. James, James City James County. County. Sure. That's it. Right. So you have, you know, one CSB serves, you know, 10 right. counties. That's the middle peninsula north of okay. that. So if you start to go back to 40 CSBs, and let's look at the 11, the 11 that serve one jurisdiction. Um, we're somewhat unique in the way we operate, okay? Um, you can have either an operating board or administrative policy board. We have an operating board. 
Okay, and I'll explain a little bit what that does. But when you start to look at the 11, the only two uh, jurisdictions that have an operating board versus the administrative board, which the administrative board really sets policy as opposed to an operating board, you know, directs the uh, provision of services, right? So when you start to look at those 11, Richmond, and you can almost say that Richmond's a little different because it's Richmond's behavioral authority. We're different. We're very different than the than everybody else. So the question is, let's at least begin the conversation of why do we stand out? Why have we chosen this form when even Chesapeake's Portsmouth, Virginia Beach, that had a single jurisdiction, they have an administrative policy board as opposed to an operating board. So that's the first piece. The second piece, are there savings? Um, you know, we went into general services. We put this Department of General Services together. Didn't put any dollars in for savings. I just really don't believe in, you know, I do have a negative number in the budget, a million dollars as it relates to the voluntary retirement incentive program, because I know we're going to get that in more. I know we're going to get savings in general services. It's just because if you get four different departments that all have accountants, at some point you can have some kind of consolidations. CSB, will there be a savings? I can't guarantee it. But the question is, is there something that we can do in terms of the operation that may provide for better delivery services? When it's all said that if we go into this and within the next six months we find out that that's not the case, I will not make a recommendation to this council to pull CSP in if it doesn't make a good business case. But I will tell you that we are not a liar the way that we operate compared to the other electors. <coughs> this for you. Um, well, who, who, I mean, do you have you tasks? Sure, we started off with say Stanley. As sure. as Ann or well, we started off with Tom Lewis, who the guy that all he does is he's supposed to look at efficiencies in government. Okay. So from Tom, what we're doing now is we want to have, again, and what I said last Tuesday, I don't want this to be a you know a secret endeavor. I want to get Maureen at the table. Right. I want to get folks at the table to just really sort out is this what's best for us. I will say we're an outlier. We're different than almost every other jurisdiction that's a single jurisdiction CSP. Does it make sense to, can I go on a second? Sure. Yeah, Does it make yeah. sense to consolidate with Chesapeake, Fort Worth, Virginia Beach? Uh, I think that that's something that we should discuss. As a matter of fact, people approach me and they say, Marcus, the way that you even handle your juvenile detention center, mm -hmm. you should rethink that. You right. should rethink, you know, the single jurisdiction concept. So, I, you know, there's a leading edge, bleeding edge, we hope we're leading edge, but those are the kinds of discussions that we've been having having since February 1st. Because each city can have its own advisory board. Sure. And then you can have, you can pretty much fit your services are crossing boundaries anyhow, just because people, that's how people survive and live. Sure. So my thought is if you can, if you can look to one entity, one that saves budgetary requirements across the board for all cities, have each city can have its own advisory board, and then look at that delivery of, of uh, services may be something that, I mean, it's just a thought. That's a classic entity that can be done, I think, across the board. Uh, that's just a thought, another way to, to save revenue. I've got more, but I could, I can, can I, I, we're going to do this more, sessions? right? Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. We we're going to have three. <laughs> Marcus, yeah, I, I just want to, I, I had a constituent who called me, I explained this this morning. Um, that gets services from CSB concerned about um, the million dollar cut and that was going to impact funding and how awful I am to cut them a million dollars. So I you blame me. Right, I blamed you. Um, I explained what you said in the budget book about that you we were under the impression that it wasn't going to affect it. But in an email that I received from Maureen Womack, it says the proposed budget cuts will directly impact Norfolk's Mental Health Court the only one in Virginia and our service provisions in the juvenile detention center and juvenile court. These two programs are not core mandated services and have here to and have here to for been funded through city dollars. So I, so if a decision is made for them not to use reserves to pay for those services, that's a decision that the operating board is making, not something that if, if we're we're asking them to use these reserves this year, but they're making that choice, I guess, to do that. I mean, sure. I, I don't want to see services cut. Sure. I and mean, I mean, if they're saying they're, and you need to look at that, because I know that CSB is the referrals from, from the courts. I mean, 
they'll say, if CSP is usually right there. Sure. They can't be pulling out and leaving those people hanging. Sure. I, you know, I don't totally understand the, the you email. Want to call her on yeah, my, um, what I would um, suggest is that you know, we continue to talk. My thought is that, you know, if the fund balance, if there are no calls on the fund balance, you could use the whole million dollars from the fund balance. I, I'm just saying we overmatch. Sure. And, and I just don't think it's fair to treat them differently than we treat them. Did, you, did you all get the communication from yeah. Dr. Taylor yeah. about the council presentation? You know, I mean, I mean, I thought I, it clarified a lot of what, yeah, which, yeah. what we're really. I, I, I was just curious why you were still questioning it. Well, because I just got that email yesterday after I got, I mean, his, his, his letter from them. So, I mean, she like, sent it only to you because she didn't send it to us. I guess because the constituent who called them said my name. So I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Um, we used to get information about how much the city was 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 dedicating to the to the CSP, but dedicating on a per capita basis to mental health issues. You know, I mean, I think there are some statewide statistics. It'd be interesting to see um, because we tried years ago. Tom Weaver was the CSP chair, and we really uh, improved on how much money we were spending on mental health, you know, on the community services board. How much as a short <coughs> budget we were we were putting in. I mean, these are our most vulnerable citizens, right? I mean, and there are, so to the extent that the council is expressing concern, yeah, and we're hearing it from the community about a million dollar cut, that needs real explanation, sure. you know? And I think it needs maybe something of discipline, putting something in writing, what your understanding is from them, because they'll be making choices. If they decide we're gonna, you know, cut the mental health court, for instance, which most of us think is pretty valuable. And that's something I'd wanna discuss with my community sure. services. By the way, if they've got money that they're not tapping, I don't want to discuss that with my community service board too. And you know, so I mean, we're going to have. So I think it's you probably need to put it down in writing what your understanding is, uh, what how much we we are as a community putting into uh, mental health issues, and then we'll have a meeting with our community service board and see if they, you know, if if they get if they understand how important we think it is. Uh, and you know they can make their choices and we'll make ours. But it looks to me like it's just simmering right now. It'll come to a boil here before you before too long. Okay. Very quickly, a couple things. Um, Mr. Anderson, the neighborhood plan. We put it on like work for us outside for us this year, and next year, and then we stop. You think you're going to be all finished by then? Yeah. No. No. Not not at all. We we um <clears throat> we haven't discussed it a lot. Um, what I uh, commend to this council is I'd like to get away from this concept of just um, focus on the first year of the five-year plan. Um, I failed. Um, we did focus on the first year of the five-year plan. We did get that under um, the targets. Um, years uh, two, three, and four were problematic. Year five is okay. So in order to get this um, to a place where I thought it was reasonable that I could defend it to the rating agencies, we started to say those out years of the CIP we needed to make some reductions. So when we revisit in 2013 and we get all of these within our limits, the question will be, um, you know, what can we afford in those outcomes? Second thing is, I maybe talked with the mayor, uh, placement Gother Foundation. Uh, have you talked to the director? Sure. Uh, we've had misunderstanding. Right. What's going on sure. there? Put under Nauticus and switching staff. They're not for them. Well, I'm not sure. They're supporting. Right. Whatever happened, you know, I got serious correspondence. I think it's a communication challenge <coughs> more than anything else. I totally agree. And and I uh, have not, uh, I met with the colonel in the larger group yesterday. We didn't talk about that specifically. Um, but I agree with you. I think it's a communication issue. And, I, and, I, and if it's going to be, continue to be an issue, I'll come back to the council, but I do believe that as we talk through this, it is literally an independent entity that just moving from one page on the budget book to another page. Did you talk to Bill Davis about that at the chairman? No, that's the, we had a meeting yesterday, but we didn't 
Colonel Davis, I didn't talk, we didn't talk about that specific issue. They've had some staff to staff discussions, but I will talk with them directly. Before you leave that topic, uh, we all received a, a letter from the Hotel Association. Have, did you see it? I got it. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Well, we, we need to get you a copy. Okay. And they set, they, they set forth about five or six reasons why we shouldn't go up. I, you know, I, I think you ought to, Darrell or somebody ought to take a look at the letter and respond on a point sure. by point basis to, uh, for that because that's going to become an issue too uh, here. And also the fact that you would expect that this money, if the council chooses to raise the rate, that that money will inert to their benefit. <coughs> that that will inert to sure. their benefit. So, okay. Okay. Sorry, Park, we're going to have to yeah, hurry. I, 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 okay. we, we have budget hearing tomorrow night. And the following Tuesday, we're going to do almost exactly what we're doing now. And then we'll, we got another week, we got in fact two of those meetings scheduled before we actually decide how, what we're going to do. So uh, if it's okay, we can, unless somebody's got one more question that they want to get. I actually have to leave, so I'll defer okay. okay. until next week. Okay. Um, can we roll right into this very short discussion about what we have to do? About, do you have something, Anthony? I'm just saying this is a whole different, you know, usually you come to these meetings, this is a Oh, a totally different discussion than in the past year. <laughs> We're usually talking about, you know, dollars and cents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's different. We often talk about you, got, I don't you, you, you got yours and I want mine. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> get it. Yeah. Look, um, well, we have time to do all of this. And so we shouldn't feel, and I'm not asking, I don't think any of us ought to be making decisions today. But um, at some point, we have to deal with the, the simple fact that um, we have to, to comply with the one man, one vote rule. And then the other, of course, the other guidelines that, that um, the uh, city attorney advised us of. My very, and I understand I'm on shaky ground, simple suggestion was we did one precinct, north side. And because Andy's Ward, Ward 1 has to give up, a, has, Way, way yeah, too way, big. Way too big, including all those guys on uh, at the base. And then, you know, um, uh, uh, Tommy's is way too low. That if you move the one precinct over there, you come well within the guidelines. You take North Side and you bring over. That's like 3,800 folks. And then you don't have to do anything else. And you don't have to. It's just one precinct. It's just one precinct. It moves from Ward 1 over to Ward 5, and you can leave the other th the other wards alone. And that should satisfy the Justice Department and every other, uh, and any, anyone else who has any concerns. Um, and then up on, on the Super Wards, if you did the same thing, you would qualify. You, if you move that one uh, precinct, you would qualify. Now, you could move a different precinct and get there, which is the Baron Black precinct. It has about 3,000 people or so, as opposed to the 3,800. Um, but, I mean, and the only reason I've suggested it is we have to have some sort of plan to go out to the public with so they can tell us if they don't agree or they agree. Or that's just the plan I think we ought to come up that should be on the table, at least for the for discussion. If anybody else has any other plans, Bring them out here. Uh, would you like to schedule a public hearing in the within the month or something in May sometime to start to deal with this? We could do it during one of our council sessions, or we could have a special public hearing to deal with this is, issue. I mean, if anybody thinks there's going to be a lot of, I mean, I think with, years ago we actually had a meeting maybe at, at uh, Lafayette, Lafayette Winona on re, on the redistricting and the meeting. <coughs> Because we had a lot of changes to make, we don't have. I mean, we could just do this in a simple step, but uh, I'd vote I'm, for having it at our meeting. At our meeting? Yeah, I mean, at a council meeting, not doing it separately. I mean, you guys are the ones that are located, but I mean, do you have any feel that you have to do it separately? It's be an evening meeting. Is there? <laughs> what would it entail? I mean, would it we just all go to a? Particular place and have a redistricting hearing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. It, it's like that. We just opened the floor for public comment on the proposals. I think ten years ago, a couple people brought their own proposals, 
you know, it just was a sort of a free-ranging discussion. And then we came back and we talked about what we thought was a good plan and we voted on it. And then what we did, Bernard, pretty much? Right. Uh, so any plans that are contenders, we should uh, publicize, let people know, and afford them the opportunity to comment on them. And then also anybody who's got ideas that we haven't thought of. So that sort of public hearing where everybody would be in attendance, it, it just much like the conduct of our, our meetings for the new business portion. I'd like to see them as separate meeting from council. I was thinking if it's mainly affecting the north end, but if we had it somewhere on that side of the city, so it was convenient for people to be able to talk. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think it's, I think it's important, and I understand that it, it, that we should have it. We could easily say, I could acquiesce and just do north side, and it's done. Um, but I think we need to get in. Oh yeah. Oh, I would. Oh yeah. I, I think that absolutely. That input. But we we're should do to it save near. costs. And pull. Yeah. Can we do it near? Near. Hang on, Tom. Yeah. Can we do it near? Can we do it at north side of the school in the auditorium? Oh, how about Granby High School? Granby High School. Because you got some parking, but there are going to people people from all over the city who want to talk about that, not just people in those wards. Okay. Well, I'd be surprised. How many are. Will this also include? I I, I heard that uh, Lisa's. <laughs> collapsing some precincts with the di district changes from the state. So will that be included as part of the discussion or is that a separate process? Yeah, that's that's a separate process. We have to vote on that, but it'd be good to know all that before yeah. we sure. This, this is a big this. thing. It's a once every 10 years. Yeah. You know, we should get it done. We should have a separate answer. So, what they got to be done with um, the time to what do they think you're going to be collapsed? Because that know. is I important just, to, I mean, obviously North Side is not going anywhere, but that still is important to how we go about. So, I mean, yeah, what, can, can you communicate with her? Absolutely, yes. Oh, that's a great suggestion. I mean, because we wouldn't want to go through all this and then, and have then to go find out we have to change again. precinct lines again or, yeah. or that if they've got a, a smart way to do it. Can you find out what, what precincts they're considering uh, merging? I'll, I'll do that. Okay. okay. And then next time we meet, you tell me why we've added so much into their budget. I think that the electoral budget. Yeah, it's, be, it's because of the. Oh, you, you know that. It's because of the election. Okay. I think if you do that, they'll cut the cameras off. All right. Um, we're done? Okay, over. Okay, thank you all very much.